Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar today. I'm just going to do a quick intro. I haven't done this kind of thing before, but I wanted to show you how to set up your scripture notes to watch this webinar. This is going to be a long webinar with Dave Butler and if you open up scripture notes and put Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 next to each other like this and open up the media player here you can paste in the Google link of this video. So if you're watching this video on YouTube, grab the URL, open it up here in Scripture Notes. I'll just demonstrate with a video here. And you can watch the video here. And if there's ever like text that's too small, you can make this window bigger by dragging these three dots on the right. Uh, but this lets you take notes as Dave is talking and sharing things. You can pause the video. You can do a search. If you have to leave your computer, make make note of the timestamp because this is a long video and you don't want to have to find where you're at again uh, if, if uh, you close this and need to reopen it. But this is going to be a great opportunity for you to search the scriptures and practice some of the things Dave is talking about. Now, throughout this lecture, Dave referenced some Greek words and other things, and I'm going to put those in the... YouTube description and on the web page for this webinar. So if you want to go to our website and uh, check that out or look at the YouTube description when you are looking at a, a video, if you're not sure how to get to the YouTube uh, recording, just click, you know, let it start to play and then click watch on YouTube down here, the YouTube button. And that will allow you to go straight to the YouTube uh, actual showing. So without further ado, let's get into the webinar. This is going to be a great one that you are definitely going to want to take some notes on. Thanks for watching. Welcome everybody to another Scripture Notes webinar. I'm Oak Norton and our special guest today is Dave Butler. And Dave has been a lawyer, a consultant, a corporate trainer, registered investment banking representative, and an editor for two different science fiction publishers. He has 18 published novels, and you can find those on Amazon under DJ Butler. And for his church books, he's got a couple. And uh, one of them, Plain and Precious Things, you can uh, also pick up. That's under the name D. John Butler, which, wow, that's just faded right out of my screen. D. John Butler. There you go. Uh so, he also uh, is a founder and managing partner at a training design company where his title is Monk. Probably, uh, I don't know, is that, is there a, we'll save any story about that for later. So, <laughs> uh, he also enjoys playing guitar and banjo and hangs out in Utah with his wife, their children, and the family dog. And he notes, with respect to ancient world scholarship, he has no formal qualifications whatsoever, but he does have, uh, he has studied Greek and Hebrew and uh, has obviously, as you'll see in this presentation, become a, a great student of the scriptures and has um, acquired some uh, really fascinating insight into some of the things that we're going to uh, learn about today. Now, before we begin, if you have two monitors, I'm going to encourage you, and, and probably some of you have already done this, or you've got you know a notepad ready or a, a document you're going to be typing on as the presentation goes on. Dave is going to be spending a lot of time in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. So as he's going through the Sermon on the Mount, what you might want to do if you have two monitors is put the presentation on one screen, open up Scripture Notes on your other screen, and open up Matthew 5, 6, and 7 so it's ready to go and you can follow right along and take notes. If you aren't set up on two monitors like that, uh, you you could try and just, you know, get everything to work on one screen, flip back and forth between them or whatever. But here's the deal. I have asked Dave to do something very unique that I've not done in any previous presentation webinar that we've had on here. And you're either going to like this or you're going to hate it. I don't know. Um, I think you're going to you're going to have a, an experience is is what I'm going to say. 
I've asked him, because one of my goals is to increase gospel study for people. And so I've asked him to present some stuff and then at the same time, give sort of like hints as to where to find more stuff about it. And so the the objective here is that you'll watch this, you'll make some notes, you'll go, I need to find such and such, or you'll watch this presentation a second time and you'll say, okay, now I'm going to pause the presentation here and I'm actually going to search the scriptures for this to make this connection. If you don't like doing that, he's got two books, as I mentioned, <laughs> and uh, I'll you know, a lot of uh, the content can be found there or in other presentations he's done online. But I, I wanted to try this format as a way to encourage everybody to study the gospel and um, learn to search the scriptures, because that's that's what Christ taught us to do and commanded us to do. So with that said, before Dave starts, I want to share something that I learned in this book of his, Plain and Precious Things. Um, like the first 10 pages, it's taken me a couple hours to get through because, not because it's hard reading. <laughs> I don't want to give the wrong impression. It's because he's given me so much to think about in the first 10 pages that I have literally been like searching the scriptures a lot for my morning study. So I've spent a considerable amount of time on this fascinating concept. And I'm going to summarize it, and then Dave can correct me, or he can just jump right into his presentation, which kind of comes after this. But um, the idea is that King Josiah in the Old Testament, uh, he became king at age eight, but no eight-year-old can really run a kingdom. So he had, you know, it was essentially an oligarchy, not a monarchy. And Well, monarchies are always pretty much an oligarchy anyway, with which means rule of a few. Uh, the advisors and the king that are in power. So Josiah takes kingship at age eight, but when he's 18, uh, in the Old Testament, it says they discover the book of the law in the temple. The text says it was in the temple, but um, there, I guess there's evidence that it was not necessarily found in the temple. Right, Dave? Is that... There's two different versions in Kings and Chronicles, yeah. One, one the book kicks off the uh the 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 reform program of his reign and one is uh the reform program is already in motion they find the book but uh, uh there's a law there's a general a broad scholarly consensus that um it maybe was not found maybe it was written as part of a program of <clears throat> reforming the religion of Israel in accordance with what the oligarchy wanted okay Perfect. So, in short, there's evidence that the text was corrupted in spots by people who either had an agenda or maybe a case of unbelief in things even. So, they rewrote certain passages, which then contradicted other teachings in the Bible. And as these reforms that they enacted took hold, and, and his reign was from 640 BC to 609 BC, that is the time frame when Lehi and Nephi and other prophets are on the scene, because 600 BC is when Lehi uh, leaves Jerusalem with his family. So he's seen these reforms take place, and he's out there preaching repentance, even though the Old Testament portrays Josiah as this super righteous king uh, that did all this great stuff. And what's what's really fascinating is when you start to look at the things that are in Deuteronomy, there are uh, about a dozen or so doctrines that are taught there, which contradict other passages in the Bible, and Nephi starts off right out of the gate contradicting some of the stuff in Deuteronomy, if you know what to look for, which Dave has done in his book. And so, one of Nephi's purposes in writing the Book of Mormon the way he did was to essentially say these reformists are, they, they've totally um, messed up re the religion. Uh, it's, it's, I'm just going to read this, this first part of what Dave wrote in his book here. And I, if I can find the, uh, the page immediately. Right here at the very beginning. 
The Old Testament was put together by the winners of history, especially by the reformers of the 7th and 6th century BC who edited it to make themselves the good guys. The Book of Mormon is an account of the religion of history's losers who called themselves the visionary men and whose religion was centered around visions in the temple. Now, if that's not motivation to pick up a copy of his book, I don't know what will be, except maybe the, as the presentation goes on, you'll also be inclined. This is super fascinating. And um, so essentially, Nephi's purpose was to bring people prophetically back to the true religion of the temple, to bring them back to the tree of life. And so, um, Dave, right before you start, I just want to ask a couple of questions. When when was this research discovered? Margaret Barker was part of your journey there learning about this. Is that right? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So um, my undergraduate degree is in Near Eastern Studies. And I re really since late in high school, I, I got seriously interested in religion. Um. Well, so what happened is uh, my my parents had some of the collected works of Hugh Nibley on their shelves. Uh, Hugh actually was in our ward. My dad was Hugh's bishop. Uh, I remember Hugh Nibley hiding from his home teacher Alice Muir because uh, she's kind of crazy uh, in in the chapel, right? So I I had an idea who Hugh was, and I when I was seventeen, I picked up Enoch the Prophet and read it, and this was the book that turned me on to the idea that there is an intellectual adventure here, right? That that uh, thinking um, is an important and valued way to worship God and, and is necessary to find the truth. And so, so I, I got an undergraduate degree in Near Eastern Studies, and I've been a reader um, of archaeology, anthropology, a student of languages, uh, on my own time, even as I went and got a law degree and, and went off to London to practice law. And uh, for a number of years, I, um, over a number of years, I became convinced that the Book of Mormon is a work of temple literature. And I, I had no one to articulate this to, and and no structure to articulate it. One of the one of the writers I discovered during this period, I'd, I'd read these books riding the train into London and, and back out to rural England where we live, um, was definitely Margaret Barker. There, there are a lot of others, um, writers in uh, intertestamental studies in Second Temple literature like George Nicholsberg or John Collins or James Vanderkam or, or Martha Himmelfarb. Um, and, and in particular, I was convinced that First Nephi 8 was a temple ascent scene. That is, that like a text like the First Enoch 15, okay, uh, that uh, First Nephi 8, although it purported to show a vision, the underlying structure of that vision actually was Solomon's temple. And what we were seeing could also be understood as an experience uh, playing out in in the temple and and the the meaning of the vision in part played around the uh, the the reader understanding that fact right uh, understanding that there are references to the temple furniture or the temple structure or the temple priests right I became convinced this was true uh, it all really came to a head when I got um, invited to uh, teach elders quorum. The calling was extended to me as a living in Eagle, Idaho. And they had just reorganized the elders' quorum presidency, right? They'd like set them apart after the quorum. And, and then the two counselors showed up at my house that afternoon and, uh, and uh, said, hey, we want to offer you a calling. I said, okay, so it, it's got to be elders' quorum teacher, right? Because you, you just, I just saw the presidency get, you know, sustained and stuff. And uh, they said, yes. And I said, okay, listen, I will do it. You will never have to uh, remind me. I will always be prepared. And I will never teach out of the manual. And they said, um, well, will you read the manual for inspiration? I said, no. 
They said, will you pick your subjects from the manual? I said, no, you should assume I will be unaware of what is in the manual entirely. <laughs> they said, let us think about it. <laughs> so, so they went and thought about it and came back and said, okay, we'll give it a try. And then, so what happened is I then had a, basically a 10 year run over four different wards, actually, where I used elders quorum classes to teach a free range book of Mormon class which focused heavily around the Book of Mormon as temple literature. And early in that, so I think I got the calling maybe in something like 2008 uh, and uh, 2009 maybe. But in, two, in 2011, I sat down and in kind of a white hot fury, uh, wrote out these two books to capture what I was thinking. Um, so uh, since then, I haven't written other books. Uh, I have additional thoughts, but I stand by what I wrote for sure. Um, with, with, I mean, a couple of here and there, I know I made little mistakes, but the big points of the argument, I fully stand by. Um, I have uh, occasionally been asked to give firesides uh, on this stuff. And then weirdly, actually, Oak, I don't know if I've mentioned this to you, but in the last eight weeks, I, I got a number of requests uh, and usually like once a year somebody wants to talk to me about this but in the last eight weeks i heard from you but also i just recorded with rick bennett for gospel tangents yesterday and about three two and a half three weeks ago i went on the stick of joseph with those guys um and people are talking to me about like a, a an event in march out of nowhere there's been this uh surge in people approaching me about it so i don't know what that means uh if anything uh, but I am excited to be here to talk about this stuff with yeah. uh, everybody who's interested. Well, I think I think what it means is when people like I grew up in the church uh, and I've studied the scriptures my whole life, which means I've realized as time's gone on how little I know. And so when when an idea comes along like, hey, there's this the Deuteronomists and and then this other um temple religion colliding in some way it's like well i've never heard this i gotta look into this a little bit so i i think there's an interest in that and the tie-ins to the book of mormon the possibility that layman and lemuel were deuteronomists and and clashed within their family that way i mean it's, it's fascinating uh, you know on a on a level where you know it's like you're familiar with the book of mormon you've read it dozens of times and now like it just gets turned on its head kind of and so it's i think that's that's part of the reason it's it's like new <laughs> new wine in a new bottle i don't want to say, <laughs> I better not say it that way <laughs> but uh you know obviously the the, the stuff that uh you're you're going to talk about shows that the book of mormon was really the work of somebody who was simple and not well educated and so Joseph Smith just made this all up, right? I yeah. mean, I just want to... <laughs> it's a compelling case that obviously... No, that's interesting. So in in the uh, in these elders quorum classes, I like to end um, always on a so what conversation. Say, okay, so there's this, so what, right? And, and in that conversation, I like to bring up regularly what I call the genius Joe hypothesis because, because we have a tendency to undervalue the Book of Mormon in, in conversations about Joseph Smith and his ministry. And we say things like this, oh, he was just the aw shucks farm boy, he was poor, no education, the guy couldn't even spell, he never could have written the Book of Mormon. That's a terrible defense. Here's a better one. If Joseph Smith, assume Joseph was the smartest man on earth, okay, and had done doctoral work in theology and spoke Greek and Hebrew and, you know, uh, Gize and ancient Egyptian and had access to the Metropolitan Museum and all of the library books in New York City. He couldn't have written the Book of Mormon, right? I don't think there's any human being alive who could have produced the Book of Mormon as it is. And I, in, in, in the year 1830 or today, frankly, and I, um, uh, I, th I think, I think really for me, the conversation has just gone way beyond, uh, trying to show what the Book of Mormon, whether the Book of Mormon is true. Like people, you know, the thing about proof, Oak, right, is that proof is in the judgment of the hearer. 
So like people are going to listen or not. It's kind of up to them. And I'm glad people, someone is willing to keep having that conversation. But I want to talk about what does the Book of Mormon mean? I want what does the Book of Mormon mean? You know, it's uh, 2024. That means uh, we, broadly speaking, have had the Book of Mormon for 195 years. Okay, 200th anniversary coming up in five years. Uh, we don't have the whole thing. Right. We were told we'd get the rest of it when we live up to what we have, right? And uh, and where is it? <laughs> where, where is it? We are, uh, we're failing somehow, right? And like systematically, and for 195 years, we are failing to come to terms with what the Book of Mormon is actually telling us. So we're doing it wrong. And, and I'm going to present a new way to re read the Book of Mormon and see more meaning today. And I don't know that my way of seeing it is the, the answer, right? Like, I don't know that if everybody in the church became a, a Davist Mormon, like suddenly would we get the rest of the Book of Mormon? I have no, I don't know, right? Um, but I got to try. And by the way, I am seeing the chat, so I see I see the comment. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, yeah, Joseph was. I think Joseph was very smart and very charismatic, right? And mm -hmm. it doesn't matter; he couldn't have produced this book, right? Well, okay, so we've waxed on about this. Let's just jump into it. So, if you if you want to start uh, sharing your screen and and uh, yeah. jump in, let's do it. Absolutely. So let's see. I got double click there. Oh, my, yep. Perfect. my screen that I'd carefully dragged over moved back. Wow, I share my screen and everything gets messed up. I am on two screens, as you suggested we might be. Okay, okay so you may see me looking down here to see stuff. Um, so be it. Um, all right, let me let me talk about the general idea, uh, first of all, okay? Um, look, as Oak said, um, I think it's quite clear that... <clears throat> Uh, Nephi and Lehi are not the majority religious party of their day, right? Uh, the majority religious party seems to be aligned with the royal tribe, the tribe of Judah, or uh, Nephi uses the phrase, the Jews who are at Jerusalem. And uh, how do they feel about what Lehi uh, is doing? Well, they want to kill him, <laughs> okay? So Lehi is the minority on the run guy. Uh, he... Um, he, uh, he, Le Nephi, uses the term for his father, which then Sariah also uses, and then the layman Lemuel use, which is visionary man. Um, and uh, Lehi accepts it. Yeah, I am a visionary man, right? It seems to be um, acceptable to Lehi that that is a way to think about his uh, party. Very interesting, by the way, there's a book called Dawn of Apocalyptic by Paul Hansen, where he talks about the rise of uh, the genre of apocalyptic and the apocalyptic writings uh, at the end of the Old Testament or, or the intertestamental period. Um, and it's, it's uh, he connects it, a couple interesting things. One, he connects that with Isaiah and the followers of Isaiah. And uh, one of the things we should, we should see easily about Nephi and Lehi is their followers of Isaiah. And also he calls those people visionaries. So it's interesting to read that book, being familiar with the Book of Mormon, and read Hansen talking about the visionaries this, the visionaries that, the visionaries the other thing, and think that, well, that's a title that uh, Lehi seemed to uh, accept for himself. So Lehi and Nephi are temple people. Uh, how do I know this? Well, I know this... Uh, let's just discuss for just a moment, uh, First Nephi 1, okay? Uh, the very beginning of the Book of Mormon, uh, verse 1, okay? This is how far we get into the Book of Mormon before the temple comes up. First Nephi 1, 1. Nephi says, um, uh, having known the goodness and the mysteries of God, therefore I write this book. Now, uh, mysteries is a word that uh, we sort of um, have lost the ability to, to hear in its original meaning. And uh, the, um, well, you know, we, we, we're post-Edgar Allan Poe, a mystery is a crime story for a detective to solve. Um, or uh, we're post, you know, 1500 years of Catholicism. So a mystery is a religious uh, doctrine that I can't, prove logically, I can't come to rational grips with it, the mystery of the 
virgin birth, the mystery of, uh, you know, the Trinity or something. Neither of those uh, is the original meaning of the word mysteries. Mysteries in Greek are mysteria. Mysteria are ordinances, okay? They're liturgy, but they're, uh, in particular, long ordinances, complex liturgy that are animated by a drama, okay? There's a myth, a story inside these uh, um, these long ordinances. And so participants would go, uh, to the best, as best as we can tell, would go act out these stories in, in a very complex ordinance. Uh, in, and these were sacred and they were secret, and so we actually have only indirect information about them. But uh, famously, the mysteries of Eleusis, which are apparently connected with the story of Demeter and Persephone, uh, or the mysteries of Isis. And uh, critics think that uh, Apuleius's The Golden uh, Ass is, uh, contains um, subtle references, so subtle that we can't understand them, to the, the mysteries of Isis or the Orphic mysteries. Okay, Nephi says in verse 1, having known the mysteries of God... Having known the mysteries of God, therefore I make this book, right? The, the Book of Mormon has something to do with Nephi's temple knowledge, right? His knowledge of the temple has something to do with the reason why he writes the book. That's really interesting. By the way, he then immediately proceeds to show us back-to-back uh, twinned temple visions. This is a characteristic of apocalyptic literature that it tends to show two visions each of which is uh, fundamentally the same vision through a different lens, so the two visions uh, explain each other. Nephi does this twice in First Nephi, right? He does it First Nephi eight, his father's vision, and his own explanatory vision, First Nephi eleven to fourteen. Uh, but he also does it twice. He does it uh, has twin visions in First Nephi one. Uh, Lehi, Lehi is going forth. He sees a fire upon the rock. Um, a fire upon the rock. There was a rock in the. Uh, Holy of Holies at Jerusalem. This rock is still there. This rock is so important, it has a Wikipedia page. Okay? So go look up the foundation stone on Wikipedia. You'll see a photo of this rock. It's a piece of the bedrock that juts up uh, through the earth. Okay? Uh, it is the rock, that the dome of the rock, the mosque that currently sits where, where Solomon's temple used to sit, is named after. So uh, the uh, it was when the when the temple was here, it was in uh, inside the Holy of Holies. Okay, there's a boulder inside the Holy of Holies, and on this rock, the Ark of the Covenant rested. And the Old Testament doesn't say that, but we know that because the earliest rabbinical writings, the Mishnah, which is the oldest part of the Talmud, which dates to the second century A.D. Okay, temple temple's been destroyed. Uh, Jewish scholars are uh, having having a debate, right? We've been traumatized. The presence of God has been taken away. What we have all these the calendar and these these ceremonies, and they all involve the temple, and now we don't have it anymore. What do we do? How do we how do we obey God, right? And that's the great debate and discussion of the Talmud. It's a wonderfully humane, beautiful piece of literature. And Tractate Yoma is part of the Talmud that. Uh, talks about the Day of Atonement. And in there, uh, it says that, uh, hey, in the in the Day of Atonement ritual, Leviticus chapter 7, we had to do certain things with respect to the Ark. Well, we lost the Ark, actually. You know, we've just lost the Temple now because Titus destroyed it, 70 AD, the Romans. But we lost the Ark back sometime earlier, not 100% clear when, Okay. So, uh, so what? How did we do our Day of Atonement ceremonies without the Ark? And they say, well, the Ark used to sit on the foundation stone. Okay, the Ark of the Covenant sat on the foundation stone, and what what we would do once the Ark was gone is is the blood that we used to spell, splash on the Ark, we would splash on the stone. Okay, so we know there was this stone in the Holy of Holies uh, at Jerusalem. Again, it's still there. The throne of God we know from Daniel. Daniel's vision of the throne of God is that it is fiery. And uh, by the way, that same idea is in 1 Enoch 15, which is, which is the, the, uh, in the race of books to get into the Bible, 1 Enoch is the one that didn't quite make it, but probably should have. Okay, 
And there's a vision of Enoch going up to heaven, and heaven is clearly Solomon's temple, and the throne is on fire. Why does this matter? Because a fire on the rock, Lehi's first vision, is the throne of God. Okay, the Ark of the Covenant, it's God's chariot, it's God's throne. It has a seat, the mercy seat on top of it. And per Daniel, it is burning, it is, it is on fire. So the fire on the rock is, is God's fiery throne sitting on the boulder, sitting on the foundation stone. Now, we, we can be sure that's true because, or we can be sure, these are all hypotheses and interpretations. We can be confident that that's not a crazy reading because we then immediately get a second version Right, a, a, apparently a second vision, um, which is Lehi goes home, falls on his bed, another vision. What is it? It's the throne. Right? These aren't two separate visions. They're the same thing. Fire upon the rock, the throne of God in his temple, one who is uh, like the sun descends and 12 who are like stars come after him. Okay? That is a vision inside the Holy of Holies of the temple. So uh, that alone should convince us to take seriously the possibility that the Book of Mormon is a book that has a lot of temple con content. Now, what I am going to do, so he here's, here's, let me amplify a bit of my hypothesis. I think that the uh, Nephite prophets, who are the visionary men as they continued into the New World, the Nephite prophets were temple initiates. They worshipped in the temple, and they saw... They participated in the mysteries of God. They saw things with their eyes and heard things with their ears that became, in, in a way, a kind of a code. Because when they wrote this book, Nephi, but also Jacob in his speeches, uh, Mormon, Moroni, right, Alma, when, when they were giving their speeches, when they were writing, when they were editing the book, they, they used those symbols the things that they saw and heard in the mysteries of God, to, uh, to communicate. They assume that their audience is an audience of visionary people just like they are. And so uh, the, a great tool, maybe not the great tool, maybe not the, a unique tool, but a great tool for getting more meaning out of the Book of Mormon is to, the re is to read it through the lens of the temple. Okay, to read it as initiated people. Now, one thing uh, that that means is if we have temple experience ourselves, our temple experience should inform what we are reading. Okay, if we read something that rings temple bells, we should acknowledge that that is probably not an accident. But two, there is another great key, and it's the Sermon on the Mount. Now, what follows? I'm going to tell you, I, I is, is not principally my discovery. Jack Welch wrote a book in I want to say late 80s, early 90s called the Sermon on the Temple, Sermon at the Temple and the Sermon on the Mount, um, which is where where he really talked about this. Now the trick about Jack's book is he was so discreet in getting to the point um, that actually people, including me, read the book and miss the point because the point of that book is that the Sermon on the Mount is not a sermon. Okay, it's, it, you know this in your heart. Go take the sermon. Next time the, the physical, physical facilities rep calls you in to go clean the chapel, okay? Stick around when everyone else is gone. Just go up onto the pulpit and open to Matthew 5, 6, and 7 and read it as if it's a sermon. It's a rotten sermon. Right? It doesn't make sense as a sermon. There's not an introduction. There's not a summary. It's not obvious what the what the point is that builds over the over the over the three chapters. It's a terrible sermon. And so, in fact, the conventional scholarly view is to say it's not a sermon. It's just col a collection of sayings of Jesus. So Jesus, and, and by the way, maybe it's copied out of a previous book. The two source hypothesis is is a is a view commonly held by scholars that says Matthew is writing the gospel he has mark in front of him and he has a document that we don't have but it's something like the gospel of Thomas and and we're going to call it Q okay which is for the german word for source it's a source document it's just a bunch of random sayings of jesus and so matthew goes you know i'm going to have uh you know the the wise man the genealogy i'm going to have the wise man hey matthew 4 jesus gets tempted what am i doing now i'm going to copy three chapters of random sayings of jesus okay now i'm going to move on to other stuff right that's the conventional view 
for what the Sermon on the Mount is. That's a terrible way to understand it. A better way to understand it is that the Sermon on the Mount is an ordinance. It is an ordinance. It is, in fact, a mystery. Jesus, in Matthew uh, 13, I think, refers to this as the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven or the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Okay, This set of three chapters. Now, ordinarily, when I talk about this, what I do is uh, I sort of enter in through one of various doors and then go very slowly through this ordinance because I will stop and I will point out, hey, you ought to go, uh, you know, uh, let, let's, let's, let's see an example of uh, uh, other texts, in particular in the Book of Mormon, where the Nephite prophets refer to this, okay? And, and look how it adds additional, look how our understanding that the Nephite prophets are using temple language expands our understanding of this ordinance and confirms that it is an ordinance, okay? So this is, this is the experiment. I'm not going to do that, or I'm not going to do it very much. It may feel like I'm still going very slow, but I'm going to be going in turbo mode, believe it or not. <laughs> uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll comment on the Greek a bit and some Hebrew suggestions, but mostly I'm just going to read it straight out of your quadruple combination. I have lds.org open on the uh, monitor in front of me. Okay, I'm going to read out of that. Um, and I am on the slide going to give you homework. I'm going to, I'm going to make comments and then I'm going to say, uh, hey, go find this. Okay, and, and that is homework. I'm not going to sit here and wait for you to find it and uh and then uh you know discuss because then 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 it would be an eight-hour conversation <laughs> which i'm up for someday we can we can all get together uh at the wilkinson center and have that conversation but i'm going to assign you homework and so i would invite you to screen cap it or watch the recording later or take notes um every one of these questions uh well you'll see i say find find this has got at least one example, and some of them have multiples where you'll go and you'll look in the Book of Mormon and go, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, okay? So, um, all right, my chat got, sorry, my, my uh, when I started sharing, my chat and the sharing uh, split apart on separate screens. So I will try to keep an eye on the chat. So uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, but I, I probably won't be typing in it like I thought I might. Um, okay, so um, Matthew 5. Matthew 5. Now, by the way, what do I have on this on the left of my slide here? This is a uh, simple diagram. Uh, I did forget. It's a... Uh, What's the, what's the comment of Doc Brown in Back to the Future? I, it's uh, forgive the crudity of the model. I didn't have time to build it to scale or to paint it, something like that, right? <clears throat> it's a simple diagram, um, and I'm not going to talk through uh, the sources of where it comes from, but but uh, 2 Kings 6 and 7 um, and Chronicles 3 and 4 um, and uh, the Exodus discussion of the tabernacle, okay? They all tell us the temple... Well, the tabernacle is two rooms. The sort of first room is the outside area in front of the door. Okay, but there's a there's a three part structure, and I'm just going to and and by the way, uh, the Sermon on the Mount is a a uh, sermon in three chapters. So I'm going to suggest to you this is an ordinance in three rooms, and I'm going to kind of show you very simply and the diagram as we go forward what that probably looks like. Okay, just to help our visual imaginations. So, uh, by the way, here's that means that here's our first uh, here's our first find point. Um, as you're reading the scriptures, generally uh, keep an eye out for texts that are in three part space. Okay, anything that happens in three rooms or in three tents, especially where it's going up and down. I'll tell you, there's a Great example in Exodus of an ascent through three-part space that tracks a lot of what we're going to say today. And I will tell you that there is, a, there is a great example in the Book of Mormon of three-part space where we see the Lord coming down and up and down and up through three-part space. Um, and uh, that should be, that's, that's a, before we even get into the text, that's the first marker. But let's get into the text because it's good stuff. So, um, one, 
And seeing the multitudes, he, Jesus, right, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. So if this is an ordinance, what is it about? Well, it appears to be uh, the ordinance of coming unto the person who was sitting on the mountain. Now, that's interesting. Because first of all, whenever we see a mountain in ancient scripture, we ought to think about the possibility that we're really seeing the temple. A mountain equals heaven equals the temple. That's a basic correspondence. It's not, it's not always the case that every mountain is the temple, but it is often the case. So we should be sensitive to that possibility. So question mark, is this about approaching someone who sits in the temple? Well, if so, there is in fact a chair in the temple. There's a throne. The throne of God sits on the rock in the Holy of Holies. So this this is is this an ordinance about approaching God to meet God in the Holy of Holies? Boy, that's provocative. By the way, fun fact. Uh, fun fact: the uh, verb Hebrew, the verb in Hebrew to sit is yeshav, which also means uh, to dwell. So uh, look, we have the Sermon on the Mount in, in Greek, um, and uh, and I'm going to refer to that Greek. But if if Jesus were were really doing this in Hebrew. Or, and this is my hypothesis, if Nephi knows this exact ordinance, he doesn't know it in Greek. He probably knows it in Hebrew. In which case, uh, it, it's, it's uh, an ambiguity of language. We're approaching the person who sits upon the sacred mountain, who sits in the temple, slash, so this is and, we're approaching the person who dwells in the temple, on the sacred mountain. Okay, that's what this ordinance uh, is is all about. Now, by the way, fun fact, um, there's a great, uh, Nephi uses the phrase mysteries of God. I will tell you this is early, by the way, actually, and very interesting uh, way to spend an hour or two is to look up all 20 reference appearances of the word mysteries in the Book of Mormon and just think about them. We're not going to touch on them, but but that's an interesting thing to do. Um, this is an early reference where Nephi equates the mysteries of God with meeting God. Okay, I will let you. Uh, this is this is your homework. Homework. I will. I I'm champing at the bit. I want to point it out to you, but I won't. I'll let you go look it up. Let's get back into the text. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, "All oh, this is good stuff. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven." We call these the Beatitudes, right? Um, uh, from the Latin, uh, beati, meaning happy, are the ones who are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, I'll read through this and make a couple of comments. Uh, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are uh, they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, notice that that blessing is repeated twice. Verse 3, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, 11, blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven. So <clears throat> there's a lot to say about these, and I'm not going to say it all. Maybe we'll have a future conversation where we'll get more deeply into some of the images that are that are buried here if we look at the Hebrew. Here's what I want to tell you now, though. If you go through and count, what you find is that there are nine Beatitudes. In other words, blessed are X. Okay? But one of them doesn't have a blessing. Okay? And... Uh, and one of them, the uh, uh, is eleven uh, doesn't have a blessing, and the kingdom of heaven is repeated twice, which means you have nine beatitudes, but you have seven blessings. Now here's the homework. Okay, there is a uh, Book of Mormon text where a prophet is preaching to people. The context is not specified, which means interesting question: Could it be the temple? But in that chapter, he talks about Garden of Eden. He talks about putting on the robe of righteousness, and he talks about passing through the straight and narrow gate, meeting the Holy One of Israel there, and building on the rock, all of which we're going to see is temple imagery. Okay, And in that context, in that sermon, this Book of Mormon prophet gives a list of nine inverted beatitudes. Rather than saying, 
blessed are so and so because such and such. He says, and I'm I'm going to paraphrase so I don't give away the chapter. Basically, cursed are so and so because such and such. So he rather than nine beatitudes, he has nine uh, damn damn attitudes. I don't know what you'd call them. Nine uh, nine nine curses. Except that there, are, except that the the two of the curses are repeated, two of the consequences are repeated. So you have a list of nine people who are being called out and seven curses, just exactly like here. You have nine groups being called out and you have seven um, blessings. Okay, I'll let you find that. Now, by the way, we're going to come back to these seven blessings, and I'm going to show you something about them. Um, I will tell you now, though. It can feel like a random grab bag of stuff. They they shall be comforted. They shall be filled. The mercy, what? Uh, we're going to see that um, this list of seven blessings um, are arguably, this is all a reading, it's all a hypothesis, map out the climax of this ordinance. So it is a plant and a payoff, right, in, 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 in fictional terms. Or in other words, it's uh, that tends to suggest that what we're seeing is real because there's complexity here. Because Matthew said Matthew gives you up front, here are the blessings, and then he shows how you get the blessings over the course of the ordinance. We'll come back to that. Verse thirteen: uh, Ye are the salt of the earth. Oh, this is good stuff. But if if the salt hath lost, hath have not hath have lost his savor. Wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. Uh, you're salt, but if you don't do what salt is supposed to do, you'll be cast out and trodden underfoot of men. Now, I think this is a covenant penalty. We're entering a complex ordinance here. Okay, We have a, we have a story. We're going to see multiple reasons in the Sermon on the Mount, but even more reasons once you start poking around the Book of Mormon to think that the story of this ordinance is the garden story. It's the Adam and Eve story, okay? And early on in this ordinance, we're given a covenant penalty. So if you are, uh, you're supposed to be salt. If you fail, if you fail, the, what's going to happen is you're going to be cast out and you're going to be uh, trodden upon. Now, that in itself is, is very interesting, but let me give you two pieces uh, of homework in, in, in the Book of Mormon, <laughs> okay? that relate to this. One, there is a famous Book of Mormon um, bad guy, okay, um, who when I was a young man, he was held up as the type of the apostate intellectual. Like, oh, beware, don't be an intellectual because this might happen to you. I don't think that's correct. I don't think that's what he is. Um, because he rails against the traditions of your father's uh, he makes claims about meeting angels, and then uh, he loses in his confrontation with the Nephite prophets. And the the penalty for his sins is that he is cast out and trodden underfoot and dies. That is to say, and it's your homework to find this guy, one of the great Nephite apostates, who I don't think is an intellectual, I think he's an apostate temple priest, Okay, he's a man who made the covenants and broke them flagrantly, knowingly. Alma says, you know you're lying. Oh, I just gave it partly away. The prophet he confronts says, I know you're lying, right? And, and, and the price for that is he dies the covenant penalty. Now, that's in the Book of Mormon. Here's another passage in the Book of Mormon. There's a moment when one of the Nephite generals has to exhort his, uh, his people, okay, his, his soldiers. And... Uh, and he does it with an oath, and they act out the oath, and they and they sw and they take they they take upon themselves the responsibility uh, that they will be trodden underfoot uh, if they don't live up to their oath by treading something else underfoot. Okay, which again I think is a way to say a, a you go find that passage. Uh, B, <clears throat> it gives us new information about the Nephite general because it tells us that he's. He is one of the visionary men. We don't have anything from his perspective, but uh, but we now know, we now can see that here he is a covenant man using the covenant language to bind his covenant soldiers to the grim task they need to undertake. All right, that's verse thirteen. Boy, I said turbo mode, but this is going to be this is we just have a lot to cover. That's all. Um, 
we'll, we'll speed up a little bit. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. And there's a lot going on here, as in any of these verses. So, um, one, we are going, we are approaching in this ordinance a light. And we don't have time to talk as much as I would like to about the temple menorah, but it's very important, okay? It's getting a reference here. But there's something else here, because, because verse 14 says, you are the light. You people who are going through this ordinance, you are the light. Now, that's fascinating. That's fascinating because, uh, because Matthew, in Matthew 13, which is a chapter where Jesus talks about the reason why he teaches in parables is because so that the people who have known the mysteries of the kingdom of God can understand him, and those who don't know the mysteries of the kingdom of God don't understand him. Go check out Matthew 13. Okay, that's good stuff. Later in the chapter, Matthew says the righteous shine in the kingdom of God. These words are also repeated by Alma and Alma 40 talking to his son Corianton. Um, this is not the homework. I'm just telling you the background here, right? The righteous shine in the kingdom of God. Wow, you are the light of the world, right? This is this ordinance is about not only approaching God, but it's about becoming the righteous who shine in the kingdom of God. And when Matthew says this, by the way, he says, um, who has ears, let him hear. Ho echon ota akueto is the Greek. The one who has ears, let him hear. Which is a marker Matthew uses to say, here is a sacred secret, and I will say no more. But those who have ears, let them hear. Okay, which is the same language Jesus uses in Matthew 13. Those who know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, they will see and they will understand. This is the method of the Hebrew of the Hebrew prophets. It's the method of the Nephite prophets. At least twice, uh, actually, no more, more than at least three times, uh, maybe maybe more than I'm not remembering. In the Book of Mormon, we see the righteous shining. I'll let you go find those. Um. All right, we're back in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Wherefore, or sorry, whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So this again, hey, we're, we're going to meet someone who is sitting, someone who is dwelling. It appears to be that where we're going is the kingdom of heaven, right? The place where God's throne is, the holy of holies. But also look at this, you know, verse eight, 17 and 18. There's, there's, a, there's a reference to the law of Moses here. Now, I think there's a, there's a moral idea, which is, look, just because you are about to become one of the um, shining ones, one of the peaceable ones, one of the wise, does not mean you get to start breaking commandments. You got to keep all the commandments. I think that's one idea. Uh, the uh, Rosanna, I, I, Rosanna, I see your comment. Uh, yeah, that's terrifying, uh, as is the fact that we don't have the Book of Mormon a sealed portion after 195 years. It's terrifying. Okay. Um, there's a reference to Moses here. Why does that matter? Well, if we, if we look down, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but if I, if I, if we look at the bottom left here of my slide, we got like a woman and a man going through the ordinance. Um, you may notice that these are icons for, you know, restroom signs. <laughs> Didn't have time to build it to scale or paint the model. Sorry. Uh, and then you have a, you have someone, a third person who's taking them through the ordinance, right? This is, this is clearly a long and complex ordinance. So it, it's not as simple as saying the Shahada or even as simple as Alma grabbing Helam and baptizing himself, right? So someone's got to guide you through this. Now, I think but there are a series of subtle hints that we can sort of identify who's guiding people through this. And I, and I think this is a hint that at this point, the person who is leading you through the ordinance, um, uh, the technical word for that is a psychopomp. If you're reading, uh, uh, if you're reading like scholarly literature, a psychopomp, a guide of the soul. Okay. Um, is, is, um, 
if we think about it in like material terms, like if I watch someone doing this, what would I see with my physical eyes? Somebody dressed as Moses. Okay, a person who's wearing something or acting in a certain way or delivering scripted lines. So we all said, ah, oh, yep, that's Moses. Moses is leading me through this. Now, by the way, I will tell you right now, I think that the uh, the sequence of priests that leads us through this is Moses and Elijah and then the Lord, that is to say Jesus, that is to say Melchizedek. Okay. Um, and I will throw that out there. There are uh, several texts you can find uh some are in the book of mormon but some are elsewhere that group those three uh group those three together so um i think here we i think here we get this hint that moses is on the stage you have heard by them uh you've heard that it was said by them of old time thou shalt not kill and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment but I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Isn't that interesting? So in this in this ordinance, there appears to be an altar. And uh, but you 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 have to be in a particular state to approach the altar. You have to be reconciled with your brother. Okay, if if your brother has something against you, so it's phrased as if you if you sinned, right? And and your brother is upset at you. But if there's if there's something disturbing your relationship with your brother, you cannot be at the altar. You have to wait until you have fixed that that problem. Now, speaking of scary, here we go. Agree with thine adversary quickly. Verse 25, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. I think that's a senine in third Nephi. Okay. Now, this is interesting. Uh, the, the word ant adversary here. Uh, what's the or adversary? The, what, what's the warning? The warning is uh, if you are in debt to the adversary, the adversary uh, doesn't have power himself, but the adversary can can have the judge and the officer. He can exert his claims on you, and the judge and the officer can throw you uh, into uh, into prison. Right? That's the warning. Now, the word adversary is fascinating because it's actually antidikos. Okay, I'm putting this in the. Uh, Put this in the chat, and I'm just taking the risk that autocorrect is not going to thoroughly destroy whatever I type. <laughs> Antidikos is the Greek. Dikos is a lawsuit. Anti is against. The antidikos uh, is the person who's against you in the lawsuit. So uh, in, in our contemporary English, uh, a plaintiff, a person who sues you for breach of contract is your antidikos. But also the prosecutor. The person who brings legal process against you, claiming that you committed a crime, okay? It's it, it's it's your accuser, and he can't put you into prison on his own. He has to prove his case, but then the judge and the officer will throw you into prison. By the way, fun fact. I say fun. Terrifying. There's a word for this in ancient Hebrew. Okay, in biblical Hebrew, there's there's a word that means the person who brings a lawsuit against you, the person who accuses you, and that word is uh, Satan. So if we think that this is a, a a complex drama, and people are being led forward, and there's Moses who's saying, "Remember, you got to keep the law." And you gotta, you know, if you want to get in the kingdom of heaven where you're bound, you gotta, you know, you, you can't forget all the, the laws you know it already. Uh, and um, you gotta be reconciled to your brother before you can approach the altar. A new person seems to show up. Now, uh, astute observers of popular culture will notice the new person appears to be a Batman restroom icon. That is correct, busted. So, uh, I, and I made a Batman because, look, uh, this new person is, I think, uh, is is Satan. Satan enters the drama. So I don't know what we should imagine, but maybe he's maybe he's dressed like a monster. Maybe he's dressed, uh, maybe he's wealthy to impress, right? Maybe he's dressed in a way to sort of you, the ordinary kind of Israelite, 
feel oppressed because of the show of wealth that this uh, priest dressed as Satan uh, presumably is putting on. Okay, so Satan appears to give you a warning to say, man, there are consequences. Just because you're here does not mean you have it made in the shade. It can all go bad. Okay, and then I think he disappears. Then I think he's out. I don't see, um, I'm not sure there are references to him later. Now we get in verse 27 into um, commandments, moral teachings. Okay, and um, I'm going to, I'm going to, group a whole bunch of verses together and summarize them rather than reading. But if you go 27 through uh, 32, these are teachings about adultery and divorce, right? And it's, I'm going to impose a higher standard. Remember, of course, it's, it's I, I think it's Moses. So he's saying, look, you heard that, the, that my law lets you do this. There's a higher standard that you got to live up to. Okay? If you look on somebody to desire them sexually, uh, you know, that is already a sin. If you put somebody away for divorce, uh, you're causing that person to sin, right? That's the standard that's enunciated here. Now, uh, so we might call that, you know, if we want to lump that together with a with one name. We might call it something like chastity. Seems like an obvious uh, possibility, right? So there's a teaching about chastity here. Now it gets, uh, it gets super interesting here in the... Uh, in the next verses, uh, having so having communicated, let's say the law of chastity, we get this again. Ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. There's a teaching about oaths and swearing, but I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Now isn't that interesting? So we get all the preliminaries, we get the warnings, we know what the stakes are, we get the first moral teaching, the first big moral teaching is chastity, and then we get this. How do you swear an oath? Just say yes or no. Just say yes or no. Suggesting possibly, question mark, that what we have here is is our, our Eve and our Adam down here, having uh, heard the new te the teaching of the new higher law of chastity, are said are told, listen, you don't have to like swear some elaborate oath to this, but you have to say yes or no. By the way, a piece of uh, homework for you. Um, go take a look in the Book of Mormon, and you will find this oath here, this oath that is forbidden, okay? Uh, don't swear by heaven, uh, don't swear by the earth, don't swear by the great city, don't swear by your own head. Okay, except for the Jerusalem part, take that out. But the rest of this forbidden oath is, uh, it appears in the Book of Mormon as an oath sworn by a secret combination, by villains. Okay, the oath that is forbidden to those who are going through this ordinance is the one that these men swear as they set about to murder a king. I will let you find that. And I will make this comment. That's because in the Book of Mormon, okay, the secret combinations are not a random villain. They are the antithesis of the visionary men. They are the intimate enemy. We, they're the evil version of us. We have our secrets and our mysteries. Right? They're, they're the mysteries of God, as Nephi calls them. Right, Or as Jesus says, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. They have their mysteries, and they do the forbidden things, and their goal is murder. All right, we're not done yet with Matthew chapter 5. Um, we got a couple more, couple more moral laws, and I will again kind of bunch them together um, and, and very breezily, um, characterize them. Not to say that there isn't more you could say about these, but I'm just going to, because we're already like an hour in, right? So gosh, Dave, um, verses 38 to 47, you know, what, what are the moral teachings here? Well, it's, it's an eye for an eye. It's, uh, it's go the extra mile. It's love your enemies, bless those that curse you. Maybe this is one, 
moral teaching, maybe it's a couple of moral teachings. I think we can imagine that if the uh, if these participants, if Adam and Eve, had to uh, accept the law of chastity by saying yes, then maybe in in this piece there are moral teachings one or two which we could carve out to which again they would say uh, yes to uh, um, to s effectively to swear an oath to to attempt to live. Verse 48, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now, read like that, translated like that, that is a heavy burden. The commandment to be perfect is heavy. But there are a couple of reasons to think that's not quite what this is. Okay. First of all, the word that is translated as uh, be ye, in Greek, is esistha. Esistha can be understood as a uh, command, as, a, as an imperative. But its more natural reading is as a future. Therefore, you will be perfect. Right? This is very different from be perfect. You will be perfect. By the way, that reading tends to be suggested by 3 Nephi 12, I think, I don't have it in front of me, I think it says something like, that ye may be perfect, okay? Suggesting that, that, that yeah, we should understand this here as a future, not a command. Okay, so that even, so that's, that sounds more encouraging, but there's still more to say here. What is the word perfect? Well, the word perfect in, uh, in Greek here is teleoi, okay? We'll, we'll risk the wrath of autocorrect again. Teleoi. Uh, dude. Okay. <clears throat> For a second, I thought I was going to misspell me. That's plural. Masculine and feminine together. Teleoi. Um, which means perfect in certain senses. It doesn't mean without blemish. It means complete. It means a whole. And, for example, your teleia could be your taxes. So a teleos could be someone who is whole in the sense that he has paid his taxes to the state. Okay. Not my favorite way to be whole. <laughs> uh, but also, a teleos was someone who was whole in the sense that they had gone through the uh, necessary religious ordinances to become complete. I'm a teleos because I have done all of the things, whatever those are, baptism, uh, uh, confirmation, uh, etc. Right? I'm a teleos. And that's interesting because, because that suggests, here's how I read this, okay? Uh, therefore, uh, you will be, let's just say complete for the moment, even as your Father which is in heaven is complete. Now, we have reached, I believe, the end of the first room. We're making a transition. And I think what we have here is a transition in status also, an ontological change, a change in the nature of your being. You are no longer who you were when you came here. You have become one of the whole one of the complete, okay? You're not done. You're going to get more titles before you're done, but 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 you've made an important step. Now, by the way, what is the word uh, that, again, Nephi would have heard? Well, we can only guess, but I have a guess, and I think it's a good one. Um, I think it's Shalem. I think it's Shalem for various reasons. We'll see some of them in a few minutes, Okay. Um, the uh, shalom, you may go, hey, Dave, is, doesn't shalom mean peace? Yes, it's the same root, okay? Uh, so shalom, mean, and, and peace, it, it means not only peace, it also means uh, health. So uh, if you met your Israeli friend and you were greeting each other in Tel Aviv, oh, shalom, Dave, ma shalom ha, uses the word shalom twice. Uh, shalom, Dave, peace. Uh, ma shalom ha, what is your health, right? How's it hanging, right? Is, is, is the... The, the uh, American colloquialism. Um, so shalom is peace, it's health, it's completion. So a shalom is someone who is complete or perfect or peaceable. Now that is, we're going to see, uh, ring some interesting bells. Let me assign you our last piece of homework here for this first room. I want you to go take a look in, in Restoration Scripture and just look for the word peaceable for... Uh, one, uh, where it appears in connection with the word mysteries, that's provocative. Things, they're peaceable things, things of the mysteries. 
are sometimes spelled out together. And also where peaceable, I'll tell you what, there's a, there's a, there's a discourse, I'm, uh, I'm thinking of in particular a speech, where there's a Nephite prophet, and he's talking and he says, and now I want to talk to those of you, so a subset, who are the peaceable followers of Christ. Okay? Uh, in other words, those of you, if this is Hebrew, who are the shalems, those of you who arguably have been through this ordinance and have become the peaceable ones, and therefore you can understand the things that I am about to say to you on a different level. I will, uh, I will let you find that and look at the doctrines he enunciates after that point and say, wow, these appear to be temple ideas then. All right, that's Matthew 5, the first room. We're about an hour and 10 minutes in. Um, I apparently lied grievously to Oak when I suggested we'd be done in 60 to 90 minutes, but I'm just going to keep going. You can drop if you need to. Uh, we're being recorded. You can come back later, I think. Or you can send me outraged emails and say, Dave, you talk too much. <laughs> we're all good, Dave. Keep going. Okay, awesome. Um, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. So uh, we enter the second room. Verses 1 through uh, 4 are interesting. They're about doing alms. How do you do your alms? Except they're not. Because the underlying Greek, first of all, there's two different words here, okay, that are translated as alms. First, we get one time the word dikaiosune. Dikaiosune. Look at that. Full service. I'm spelling out Greek words. The first. We get it one time. It's the first appearance. Honestly, as if it's almost backward looking. Okay, uh, so in other words, uh, take heed you don't do your justice before men. That's verse 1. To be, sorry, dikaiosune means justice. That's the point. Dikaiosune means justice. And so that's the first appearance of this word that's translated as alms. It means justice. Take heed that you do not your justice before men, otherwise you don't get a reward of your Father which is in heaven. If we're heading to the kingdom of heaven, by the way, this is a stage direction. The Father is ahead of us. We're going there. He's in heaven. He's going to appear in the next few verses several times that way. Now, the next three references that are translated as alms are a totally different word. They are elemosune. Uh, and now autocorrect is trying to mess with me. Elemosune, which means mercy. So only the first reference here is actually, the first reference is the justice. Then the three references are to mercy. None of them are actually alms. Therefore, when thou doest your mercy don't sound the trumpet like the hypocrites. They have their reward. When thou doest mercy, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that your mercy may be in secret. Right? Well, that's interesting. So, uh, one, this is a big conversation we probably won't have right now. Um, but I will say uh, that um, I think that in some important senses, uh the first room should be understood, or the first phase of this ordinance should be understood as the phase of justice. Moses is there, a reminder you got to keep the law, a warning that there, there are penalties if you don't do it. That's justice. But now we're being told justice is behind you. We're entering the room of mercy, where things are going to be a little different. Okay? Now, notice also this. How, how do you do justice and mercy? Well, verse 3 and, uh, well, verse 3, when thou doest mercy, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. Verse 4, that your mercy may be in secret. Okay. So justice and mercy seem to be something that you do with your hands, with both your hands, that is secret. So now I, I there's a certain amount of speculation in all of this, of course, <laughs> but maybe particularly here. I My guess is that at this point, Participants are making sacred gestures that are that are meant to be kept secret, that embody in them teachings about justice and mercy. Okay. Uh, by the way, thy father, uh, verse four, thy father who which seeth in secret himself shall be reward shall reward the opening openly. Okay. So the father is watching, right? The father is not here. We can't see the father on the scene. He's watching. As a stage direction, the only place that the Father can be is behind the veil, right? We're in the second room here having these teachings. Behind the veil in the Holy of Holies is the suggestion. That's where the Father must be. Now, verses 5 and 6. When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites, 
Don't pray on the street corner. Go in your closet. Shut the door. Pray to your father. And here again, your father, which is in secret, and your father, which seeth in secret, shall reward you openly. So again, stage direction. Where is the father? He's back in the third room. He is in secret, but he's watching. But there's an instruction here. This is this is not a moral instruction. It's a it's a practice instruction. How do you do something? And specifically, the question is how uh, how do you pray? Now, what kind of you is this? This is this you is thou, right? And we all know this. Thou means one person. Not first person. First person is I. One person. Second person singular. When you, Sally, pray. Here's how you do it. That's verse 5 and 6. Now look at verse 7. But when ye pray. What? Ye? Oh, yes. Ye. Ye is two or more people. Or if any of you are south of the Mason-Dixon, depending on where you are, it's y'all or maybe all y'all. <laughs> okay? When all y'all pray, here's how you do it. So let's see how 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 we all pray together. Uh, verse 7, when you pray, you do not use vain repetitions like the heathen, for they think they'll be heard for their much speaking. Um, don't be like them. Uh, your father knows what you need. After this man, I'm paraphrasing, after this manner, pray. Okay, here we get the prayer, our Lord's Prayer. This has got a super interesting verse in it. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Ooh, this is a reminder that the kingdom is still ahead of us, right? The kingdom's not here. We're approaching the kingdom of God. That's the Holy of Holies. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. I'm coming right back to this. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. There's the kingdom again. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That's the Lord's Prayer. Verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. I've seen a lot of Bible translations. They basically all translate the verse this way. And I think it's wrong, which I recognize as a reckless and bold statement. But let me tell you why I think it's wrong. The word that is translated as daily is epiousios. Epiousios. Epi means on. Okay, like epidermis is the layer of your dermis skin that is on top. Epi is on. Okay, usios means it, well. Usios is a part is a participle. Okay, usios means and it's a participle of the verb to be. So it means something like the existent one. Epiusios bread. Give us this day our epiusios bread our bread that is upon the existent one, or our bread that the existent one is upon. Now, the translators look at this and they go, mm. well, part of the problem is this is what you call a hapax legomenon, meaning that this, for this word, this phrase, appears only once in the New Testament. Okay? And therefore, it's, it's difficult to find context. The hapax legomenon is a word that only shows up once. It shows up once in the New Testament, so there's no other verses we can go look at and say, it's especially, ideally, would be if Matthew used it somewhere else. We could say, well, what did Matthew mean when he used it over here? He doesn't. This word appears just here, so we have to kind of guess. And the translators, the guess they're making is they're saying, all right, epiusios means something like upon the existent day. Right? The existent one means the existent day. So the so the epiusios bread is the bread for the existing day. It's not a great translation. Kind of makes some sense. Hey, help us eat today. Right? Except this. Except that in the Old Testament, the Lord's name is Yahweh. Okay? The tetragrammaton, four letters. Yahweh. What does it mean? Uh, good question. The scholars will, will debate slight differences, but they all think it has to do with the verb to be. The verb to be is uh, haya or transliterated like that without vowels. Okay. And so Yahweh means something like the existent one or the one who causes to exist, the one who is. 
or maybe the one who will be right. So, so we one of the that well, there's a, I'll give you an, an Old Testament and a New Testament reason to support this kind of understanding of the name. Right, the Old Testament is Exodus three. Moses gets up on the mountain. He there's a burning bush, and the voice says, "Echye asher echye." That's the Hebrew. I am that I am. Right, that's your King James translation. Literally, it m- means something like "I am the one that will be" or "I am the one who is." And so, biblical commentaries will tend to say this is the moment in which, which God Elohim is announcing that His new name from now on is Yahweh. He's the existent one, right? That's a Gentile commentary, common kind of thing to say. Um, in any case, uh, Exodus seems to understand that Yahweh's name means the one who is. Right, that's that's what gives that passage meaning. But also, if you go look at the New Testament, it's not exclusively, but especially the Gospel of John. John has Jesus make "I am" statements. Okay, he's debating with the Jews in John eight about uh, um, uh, sin and chosenness, and they say we're descended from our Father Abraham. And he says, "Before Abraham was, I am." And they pick up rocks to kill him, not because he just said, "I am super old." Because that is the statement of a kook. But because he just announced to them that he was Yahweh. I am. Okay? Or my, and I think there's, uh, there's seven maybe in the, in the Gospel of John. There's a number of these I am statements. My favorite is in the Garden, Garden of Gethsemane, where he, uh, he is approached by those who are coming to arrest him. I'm going to paraphrase it. I'm not looking at the text, but they say, hey, are you Jesus? And he says, I am and they fall down because that name is the name of power because he's announcing that he is God. Because maybe what we're seeing here is a representation of the Day of Atonement where the priest, the one day of the year, according to the, again, Tractate Yoma, the Mishnah, where the priest comes out and he uh, and he pronounces the name Yahweh, which otherwise is never spoken, and everyone lies down because that's what you do in the presence of a divine being. The priest announces Yahweh in some sense. That means he is Yahweh. Everybody falls down. Hey, by the way, footnote, we're not going to explore this today, but go look in 1 Nephi 8 at what people do when they come into the presence of the tree of life. I forget what verse it is, maybe 20. There's a little homework. It's not even in my slide. It's just bonus homework. I do have homework. I'm not forgetting it. We'll get to it in a minute here. The point is, I think a better translation for what is this, you know, give us this day our epiusio bread. It's not give us the bread we need today. It's give us the Yahweh bread. Give us the bread that Yahweh is in, or give us the bread that 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 is that is is in Yahweh, upon Yahweh in some sense, right? Very interesting, by the way, because there are at least two different ways to remember bread in the temple. And and Jesus, I think, connects himself with both. Okay. One is manna. Manna literally means. Uh, whatchamacallit. That's the Hebrew translation of manna, or the, the tra- English translation. It's whatchamacallit in Hebrew. Um, but it was uh, it was referred to as bread, and uh, it was kept in the temple. I think Numbers says it was in the presence of the Lord, which probably means the temple somewhere. But but uh, Hebrews 9, I think Hebrews 9, 3 says there's a pot of manna inside the ark in the Holy of Holies. And in John 6, where Jesus is talking to the multitudes of the, the Jews, uh, and, and he says, your fathers ate the bread uh, ate, ate the bread from, that came from heaven and died. Right? Manna. I am the true bread of heaven, and those who eat me shall not die. Right? Jesus identified himself with manna, a bread in the heaven. Now, there's a second bread, uh, sorry, a bread in the temple, which is heaven, which is the mountain right? There's a second way to talk about bread in the temple, which may be the same thing, or it may not be. But there's the bread of the presence, or the show bread, which we don't know a lot about it. We know, uh, well, Leviticus, uh, Leviticus? No, I don't think it's Leviticus. Uh, shoot, blanking on the, ch- uh, it might be Leviticus. Um, I'm going to remember the passage in a minute. Um, but in Leviticus or Numbers, uh, Aaron and his sons eat the show bread in the second room of the temple. The bread of the presence, the show bread. Uh, we know about that it was spiked with frankincense, so it's some kind of like an orange flavored, a, a, a citrus flavored kind of bread that was that was placed in the temple in the presence of God and eaten uh, by the priests. And it's described as being a zikaron, which is a memorial. So I think the King James says 
um, again, it's Numbers 24, Leviticus 24, I'm blanking on the chapter, uh, that the sons of Aaron ate this bread as a memorial offering. Which is super interesting because in Luke 22, Jesus takes bread, he takes his disciples into an upper room, and he says, and by the way, side note, there's uh, up and down matter here, okay? Because again, this is a mountain, right? This is the, the temple is a mountain here. And in Hebrew, including today, the way the Hebrew language talks about motion is if I go from where I am towards Jerusalem, like if I go from Provo to Orem, I just go. I walk or I ride, okay? If I go from here towards Jerusalem, I go up. I ascend. It's a different verb. And so if I go into Israel, I ascend. I ole. And in fact, they still today, they refer to uh, people who immigrate into Israel as olim. It means ascenders, people who go up, okay? And if I go within Jerusalem to it to sorry within Israel to Jerusalem, I go up. And if I go in Jerusalem to the Temple Mount, I go up. And if I go into the first room, I'm going up and then up and then up. And so baked into the language is the ideology. They're not dumb. They know that Mount Everest is 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 actually higher than the Holy of Holies. But in Hebrew, you would ascend from the peak of Mount Everest into the temple. If you if you describe that in one sentence, you would be going up because that's that's the ideology of altitude that is baked into the language. So when Jesus meets with his disciples in an upper room, that's actually a pretty interesting thought. They went up into a room somewhere. They eat bread. Uh, and this is Luke 22, I think, 22, 18. And he says... Uh, do eat this in remembrance of me. And is that maybe a reference to the sons of Aaron eating bread in an upper room as a memorial offering? I don't know that it is, but I think it probably is. So the prayer is not give us today's bread. It's give us the Yahweh bread. And by the way, we're in the upper room. We're in the second room of the temple. We're in the room where the, where the Yahweh bread, the show bread, was kept. Okay, there's a lot we don't know about these rooms, by the way. Uh, in, this, in this room, uh, there were pots and like scoops and shovels. And Menachem Haran, in his book, Temples and Temple Service, talks about that and says, he makes the comment, uh, the, we have no idea what these are for. And that is an important reminder for us, because we should remember that although we know a lot about what happened outside the temple, we know almost nothing about what happened inside. Well, here we are inside the temple, and we're praying to Jesus to give us the Yahweh bread. Uh, that's interesting. Before Abraham was, I am. Yeah, that's it. That, that's very interesting. Um, and, and Bonnie, I like that. Uh, and there is no comma in the Greek. The Greek punctuation basically just has periods. Well, it has periods and question marks in... in um, uh, although actually when it was written down, it might have had not only no uh, punctuation, it would might have had no spaces. <laughs> All of that came later than writing. Um, uh, it still has to be the case, Bonnie, right, that they, they understand not just that he's saying that, uh, but that he's making the claim that that's his identity, right? Because they try to kill him. They don't say, hey, hey, rowdy boy, don't be rude. They try to murder him for, for making that statement. Dave, yes. For the benefit of those who aren't going to see the chat later, uh, do you want to read that? Oh, okay, fine. Uh, Bonnie Abbott says if we change the comma, as she's referring to the verse in uh, John eight, it would read quote before Abraham comma was I am instead of before Abraham was comma I am. Um, uh, it makes more sense. Now I have to say I'm, I'd have to go look at the Greek text and just confirm that that makes sense in terms of the actual Greek, which I would take us a few minutes, and so I'm not going to go down that. But it's a, a, a very provocative comment, Bonnie, and I like it. Uh, it's at least an interesting possibility to check out. All right, we're 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 through the prayer. We've prayed for Yahweh bread. Uh, do, 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 14, but if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Maybe we're back to moral teachings about forgiveness. If you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. 
Moreover, when you fast, now here uh, we have rules on fasting, washing, and anointing. When you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance. They disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. When thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. So still at this late moment, the Father is still in secret. He's still behind the veil. But, but what does it mean, this teachings on fasting, wa fasting, washing, and anointing? Well, maybe it means, in this large, complex ordinance, that at this point, people are washed and anointed. Maybe it, it's a reminder that they've been fasting, that they've come fasting to the ordinance, right? Uh, maybe they were previously washed and anointed, and this is a reminder of their washing and anointing. Not clear. Not clear to me. Those are some possibilities. We get to what I think is the last moral instruction. Verse 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. No man can serve two masters. He'll hate one and love the other, or he'll hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Look, this is a commandment that says you've got to be all in. You can't have one foot in the kingdom of heaven, okay? If you say, well, I kind of serve God and mammon, you're mammon. If you say, well, it's not, I'm not serving mammon. I'm just, it's my career that's mammon. You can serve God or mammon. There's only two choices. If you're not all in for God, you're not for God, right? That is the, and boy, that is an exacting command. That is a strong, uh, that is strong doctrine right there. Now we get to uh, what I think is uh, uh, missed. And by the way, uh, there are a couple reasons why I think Elijah is the uh, is the figure that leads us through the second room. Um, one of them is uh, is is because of what's about to come up here. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body. What you shall put on is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment. You don't need to worry about food, drink, clothing. It's really? Is this like a St. Francis of Assisi thing? I can walk around naked? I don't think so. Dave? Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think, did you skip or read the wrong verses you you went from 1920 treasures on earth treasures in heaven talked about the god and mammon but skip the uh trying to, I'm trying to go faster and I'm I'm Got briefly uh, treating all that as if it's one commandment without Got intending it. to say there's nothing of value in it. Okay, no problem. Go ahead. Okay. Um. Behold the fowls of the air, they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Your heavenly Father feedeth them, are ye not much better than they? God will feed you. Why take ye thought for raiment? I'm skipping a verse again. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? So I don't think this is a command that says, hey, don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear. I think this is a symbolic liturgical action. I think this is a reference to what's happening in the ordinance. And I think that is a... Uh, that is a feast at which God feeds you, gives you to drink, and clothes you. Okay? Now, first of all, the, the Elijah references. Okay? A couple of observations about Elijah. One, Elijah gets a reference in Luke chapter 1 when Zechariah is in this room of the temple. And the angel Gabriel appears to the right of the incense altar. And that's why I have stood my little Elijah figure to the where the would be the he'd be to the right of the incense altar. And and the thing the angel, one of the things the angel Gabriel says to Zechariah is your son will do the work, will will have Elijah's role. Okay. So that's one reason why I think that Elijah is the 
angel or the psychopomp or the guide of this room. Another one is the nature of this feast. Okay, Elijah is uh, fed by birds. He, he eats a feast of birds in the book of Kings. That's what keeps him alive. And here you are invited to a feast that is marked by birds. Behold the fowls of the air. They sow not, neither they reap, but God feeds them. I think the feast of birds is a, is a marker of the prophet Elijah. I think a third thing is the uh, uh, the clothing. Elijah has got, uh, is, I'm going to make two, I'm going to make three points about this. God clothes you here, okay? Thing one, Elijah's mantle uh, and the idea of authority passing through the mantle or status change passing through the mantle uh, is is the, the, trans, the story of the transition from Elijah to Elisha. So, so the act of clothing has an association with, with Elijah. Okay, so for all those reasons, I think Elijah is the angel of the second room. Two other things about this clothing: um, one, there is a uh, there is a there is a story in the Old Testament in which God clothes someone. That's what's being promised here. God will clothe you. There is a story in the Old Testament where God clothes someone, and that's the garden. That's Adam and Eve puts on them coats of skin. So there's a there's a there's a connection to the Eden story. Now that's not your homework. That's just in Genesis. Here's your homework, Book of Mormon homework. You're saying about time, Dave. I thought you were going to give me a lot more of these. Okay, okay, we're here. In the Book of Mormon, I want you to go look. There's a prophet who. Um, talks about putting on the robe of righteousness in a chapter where he is talking about Adam and Eve in the fall uh, and the adversary, Satan. He talks about putting on the robe of righteousness and seems to equate that in the same verse with resurrection. You put on the robe of righteousness and then you rise uh, to your judgment. Uh by the way, the idea of rising from the dead is also an Elijah idea. Eliza and or Elijah and the the widow of Nain and her son, right? So all of those are Elijah associations uh, here here in at the feast uh, in the second room. So uh, oh shoot, I accidentally talked right over this homework. Um, I've got these in uh, uh, those two in in the wrong order. Uh, let me. Um, oh man, I accidentally. You know what? I messed this one whole up. This whole this whole slide up. I I just actually gave you several of the points. Um, here's one though. Uh, in Exodus, uh, there is a three part ascent where the middle part. I'll talk about this three room sequences, three part uh, three part space, but especially three part space that ascends that goes up uh, is temple space. There is in Exodus a three part ascent where in the middle part one has a feast. With the Lord. That's exactly what's going on here. Is a three-part ascent, and in the middle part, Matthew chapter six, one has uh, a feast um, with the Lord. Now, actually, I already gave this one away here. Um, let me throw out uh, one more point about this feast. Uh, comfort seems to be a mark. Comfort or the comforter seems to be a mark of this feast. The feast with the Lord brings comfort. Okay? Now, I don't see that here, but I think there are passages in the Old Testament and the Book of Mormon where that's pretty explicit. So that is your uh, that is your homework. And uh, suddenly, there we go. My cursor disappeared for a minute. Um, uh, uh, suddenly, um, my cursor disappeared, but it's back. So uh, go take a look in Psalms. There's a Psalm I'm thinking of in particular in the Book of Mormon where having a feast with the Lord is marked with the presence of comfort or with the presence of the comforter. Okay? Now, I've jumbled this whole slide up. Let's talk about Melchizedek. Uh, when the Lord comes down um, to feed you, to feed you and clothe you, and uh, and and give you to drink, okay. Um, I think that there are reasons to think that he does so in the capacity of Melchizedek, or that Melchizedek. Uh, another way to think about this is Melchizedek is the the authority 
or is his name uh, when he comes to join you uh, in 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 your feast and 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 to clothe you? Okay. Um, I will. Uh, so Genesis chapter fourteen, when uh, when Melchizedek shows up, uh, he is providing Abraham a feast. And the introduction to Melchizedek in Genesis 14, our translation of the King James says Melchizedek, the king of Salem. Okay. Melchizedek, the king of Salem. I think it's 14 verse 18. I could be wrong. Uh, and that's fine. Um, there's not real great evidence that there was a place called Salem. So maybe it's a poetic name for Jerusalem in the Psalms, right? Um but that there ever was like a, a city that everyone called Salem, uh, not uh, not uh, not great evidence for it. And it turns out there's another way to read the uh, Hebrew, okay? Because when Melchizedek's introduced, it says Melchizedek uh, Melech Shalem. That's the Hebrew. Melech is a king. And... Uh, the reading that the King James and other translations give is that Shalem is a place. So the, the, it's Melchizedek, the king of Salem. Except that another absolutely straightforward way to read that, with no change, no special punctuation, nothing funky, is just to say, hey, this is not Melchizedek, the king of Salem. It's uh, Melchizedek, the peaceable king. Okay? Melchizedek, the Shalem king remember this is this is the word this is the title or the status that i think people gain as they transition from the first into the second stage of this journey uh and um uh so having become one of the peaceable ones you come to the peaceable feast and the peaceable king whose name is melchizedek comes and feeds you a feast of his own flesh and blood now Melchizedek is an interesting name. Melchizedek means something like, so again, Melech is king, okay? So Melchizedek means something like king of righteousness, or my king is righteousness, or something like that. Melech is king, Zedek is righteousness, Zedek. So righteousness is the word, is the word Zedek. Now remember, back in the Beatitudes, Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, after Zedek, for they shall be filled. Filled with what? Well, you hungered and thirsted for Zedek, for righteousness. You were filled with Zedek, righteousness. Which is to say, Melchizedek comes and gives you a feast of his own flesh and blood. And that is the fulfillment of that, uh, of that beatitudinal promise. Uh, you are filled. Um, by the way, that that the, the idea that righteousness might mean Melchizedek, might refer to Melchizedek, shows up at the end of this chapter, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. We're still not there. Why? Because that's room three. Room three is the kingdom of God. We're going to enter into it. Okay, we're still seeking it. So the feast is done. Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And Melchizedek. Now, again, if it's a stage direction, I think what's happened is the Lord has come down, has provided the feast, and now he's gone back. So we have to seek the kingdom, and which means following after the way Melchizedek has gone. Now, in the Book of Mormon, there is a, a connection of Melchizedek with peace. That's your, that's your homework here. Out of order, but that's your homework to go find that. Um... Yeah, Elior says the keys of the kingdom were restored in a very curious, very curious manner. Moses, uh, Elias, uh, Elias, and then Elijah. Yeah, I think that is, I don't know all of the answers, but I think that is relevant to this conversation. All right, third room. Third room. Matthew chapter 7. Again, why, why, why are we going through this? Because, because no, your own temple experience, when you go read the Book of Mormon, okay, you will see, and, and you say, this was written for people who have temple experience. What am I seeing that connects with my temple experience? I believe you're meant to do that. 
And also, I believe that the Sermon on the Mount is an outline of the temple experience as Nephi and Mormon and Moroni, and I think maybe also uh, Ether knew it. Um, and so having in having in mind, having just nailed down, just just facile, easy to access the Sermon on the Mount, you will see these things appearing in combination and in the same combination in multiple passages in the Book of Mormon. So on top of your homework, I'm gonna we get to the end here, I'm gonna throw out a bunch more I want you to go look for. Okay. That that is the point of this. Uh Chapter 7, we get four verses, I lie, five verses on judgment. Judge not that you be not judged, etc. Uh, why? Well, you're about to enter your judgment. Here comes the judgment. This is your last warning. Then you get verse 6. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Now again, if you are just reading this as a sermon, if you think that, you know, Matthew took the hypothetical source document Q and he copied out a bunch of Jesus' sayings and put them here. This is just a bunch of random stuff. It's a random, it's random that we have a statement on justice here, and it's random that we have a statement on don't share sacred things, but it's not random. Because for all that what we've been doing until now is sacred, it's about to get more sacred. Your judgment is coming and you are going into the kingdom of God. Do not share this with dogs and swine. The um, oops, an advanced matter thing over here. Um, verse six. Nope, that was six. Verse seven. Oh man, this gets so good. Let's read verse uh, seven and eight. Ask. So you're being you're being left. You're, you're outside the veil still. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Ask, seek, knock. There is a triple petition. Okay? Um, for everyone that asketh, receiveth, and he that seeketh, findeth, and to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. And there's a reason I put everybody in front of the veil here, because I think that's where we start. Which, depending on how you think the temple was laid out exactly, might have been sort of on steps, rising up toward the veil. By the way, here's a piece of homework for you. Uh, there's a um, there's a great passage. I'll tell you this: it's Nephi. Okay, small plates, small plates passage here. There's a great passage where Nephi says he's talking and he talks about doing the things you have seen Christ do, and about faith and hope and charity, charity, and about speaking with the tongues of angels. And then he says, if you don't understand this, it's because you don't ask. And you don't knock. And therefore you are not led into the light, but you perish outside in the darkness. I want you to go find that passage. Okay. Nephi is assuming that he uh, is speaking to people who have had the same sacred experiences as he has. And who will say, oh, doing the things I've seen Jesus do. Speaking with the tongues of angels. Walking in the straight and narrow path. Asking and knocking, I understand what is being referred to here. By the way, two verses later, you'll see that uh, Nephi says, "Oh, the Spirit tells me not to say any more." So, having he's willing to lead you right up to that uh, knock, and then he won't go any further. Um. All right, verse uh, verses nine and ten. Man, this is crazy. Or what man is there of you whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? Now, all four of these, bread, stone, fish, serpent, all four of these are symbols of, of the Messiah. All four of them. Right? Jesus says, I'm the, he's the rock of your salvation, Helaman 5.12. He's the bread, John 6. Um, fish was a great early symbol of, Christian, of Christianity. He's the fisher of men. Right and the serpent. Remember that that uh, until Hezekiah took it out, the Old Testament had something called the Nehushtan, which was a bronze serpent on a stick uh, inside the um, inside the temple. And the Nephites refer to it twice. In fact, here's there's a piece of homework that's not in uh, that's not in the uh, slide deck. And oh yeah, awesome, Byron. 
Um, sorry, Byron says, so wonderful. I just had the Nephi Ask Knock passage in my reading today. Am I right? Isn't it crazy? You see it and you go, oh my gosh. So um, here's homework for you. Go find the two passages referring to the brazen serpent in the Book of Mormon. The Nephites see the brazen serpent entirely as positive. Hezekiah removes it because, well, what the what 2 Kings 18 says is that people had, had become uh, attached to it in an apostate way. They're worshiping it as an idol, right? So, uh, but we have, we have but, but think about this. So we have four messianic um symbols, at least three of which, a stone and bread and a serpent, are clearly in the temple. So maybe maybe a fish was in some way. By the way, maybe the loaves and fishes somehow connects. Maybe that story is a parable that somehow connects to the feast with God. But we have four messianic symbols. What's happening in verses 9 and 10? You're asking for symbols and being told you have to give the right one. And there are four. Now, by the way, here's another piece of homework that's not in my that's not in my slides. Go take a look at First Nephi eight, the vision of approaching the tree of life, okay, and grasping on to the iron rod. Now, First Nephi eleven twenty five says the iron rod is the word of God, and we go ah oh, the scriptures. But actually, John says the word of God is Jesus. So consider the possibility that the iron rod is not the scriptures, or that in addition to being the scriptures, it's Jesus. And then what you'll see that what 1 Nephi 8 says is you go along a straight and narrow path and just go count the number of verbs, catching, grasping, holding, that describe people touching the iron rod. There are four. As if, in 1 Nephi 8, which is another way to see this whole thing, and we have not touched 1 Nephi 8 at all, really. As if in 1 Nephi 8, what Nephi and Lehi are communicating is that to enter into the presence of the tree with good fruit, you encounter someone or something who is the word of God, and you have to grasp that someone or something four times. So, by the way, huh, there we go. I just gave away some homework. Uh, first Nephi, uh, am, I, am I ahead of myself? Okay, hold on. I got to read some. I got to read some verses. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm skipping ahead a little bit because eleven and twelve are still on the on the gifts, the exchange of symbols. But look at verse thirteen. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. So there appear to be two gates. And you're supposed to go in the straight gate, which is to say the narrow gate. But there appears to be a wide one, which you can choose, which is the wrong answer. Okay, 14, straight is the gate and narrow the way which leadeth unto life. So there's a straight and narrow gate that goes to light. Sorry, life that goes to life. Now, by the way, life, boy, this is so interesting. Um, life. We're gonna, we're gonna, as as we've done several times today, I'm gonna like touch on the very edge of a big subject, and then I'm not gonna go any further because now is not the time or place, and I'm already like, uh, I'm already two hours in <laughs> into your sixty to ninety minute session. Uh, so um, life uh, for the Hebrew prophets, puns were sacred and important ways to tell a truth. Puns matter. They're not art. They're not incidental. They're not clever. They're telling you an important truth. So when, when Adam names Eve, I think this is Genesis 4, end of Genesis 4, he says, I will call her Hava because she is the mother of every high. And the, the King James says, I'll name her Eve for she's the mother of all living. Well, that's a pun. I'll name her Hava, life, for she's the mother of every high living being. Okay? Eve is life. She's the mother of all living. Her name is life. That name is, that pun is so important that when the Jewish scholars in Alexandria and Egypt translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek, this is the Septuagint. This is like 
300 to 200 BC. Okay. They got to this passage and they felt they had to preserve the pun. And to do that, they changed Eve's name. So that in the Greek, she says, or he says, Adam says, I will call her Zoe, for she is the mother of all the Zonton. It's, it's preserving the pun. I'll call her Zoe, life, because she's the mother of Zonton, all of the living things. Okay? Life is Eve. The space where life is, is, is the tree of life is the tree of Eve. Okay, and and is there and is there in fact then a tree? Well, so if we go back and say, okay, straight as the gate and narrow the way uh, leads to life. That's fourteen. We get a warning, man. There's false prophets. You'll know them by their fruits. Do men gather gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Now, th thorns and thistles is super interesting. So uh, my my slide says akanthai and trubaloi. Those are the Greek words thorns and thistles. Why are they interesting? Because uh, this is this appears again to be a reference to the Eden story. So when Adam and Eve are cast out, I think it's the beginning of Genesis 5, uh, it says thorns and thistles spring up, or thorns and thistles infest the ground. Akanthai and triboloi is what the old Greek translation of the Old Testament says. So now we see them, we're, here we are again, Akanthai and triboloi, as we are passing through the straight and narrow gate into the presence of life. And I think... All of this is, I think, right? Everything I'm saying today, I have no authority. It is my view. I think that um, what we have here is that we should imagine that the thorns and thistles don't just kind of spring up randomly in meadows out there. They spring up like a wall surrounding Eden so you can't get back in. And so when you pass through the, the straight and narrow gate to get back into the presence of life, we're passing through a wall of thorns and thistles, a kanthai uh, and, and triboloi. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, verse 17. This is, this is where the straight and narrow gate leads you. Okay, Matthew 7, a straight and narrow gate leads to life. What is life? A tree with good fruit. First Nephi 8. I've already given away this homework. Sorry. I'm terrible at assigning homework. I want to have the conversation with you. That's it. See, I want to be there when you see the thing. I don't want to like get an email later. Oh, Dave, I see the thing. I want to be there and see you get excited. So uh, the um, in First Nephi 8, you go down a straight and narrow path, not a straight and narrow gate, but a straight and narrow path. You have to grasp something or someone four times, and then you enter into the presence of a tree with good fruit, which later Nephi is talking to Laman and Lemuel, to whom he gives only very cursory summaries of the whole vision. Right? He, he himself has four chapters of vision understanding what Father Lehi told him, but when they want an explanation from him, they're not ready. So he just says, well, it was the tree of life. Okay, so the straight and narrow path takes you to the tree of life. And, and a reminder, go look this up. People respond when they get there by falling down. Just as people fall down in Jesus' presence when he announces, I am. Now, here is a piece of homework. I'll give you this one. I won't spoil this one. Go take a look. Uh, go take a look at the Book of Mormon. See if you can find this. There's a passage where uh, a bunch of poor people and dispossessed people say, hey, we you, we are not allowed in the building. By the way, maybe, maybe, parenthetical, implying that they understand that the Nephite missionaries they're talking to preach a God who has temples, right? And they say, we we are not allowed in the building. Why? Because we're, we're poor and we have, we don't have great clothes. How can, how, how do we do this? What do we do? And there's this whole chapter in the Book of Mormon about how uh, you don't need to have the building, and you can still get on the path that leads you, and the chapter ends in the tree of life. The path ends in the tree of life, even without access to the building. Straight and narrow gate, tree with good fruit, wherefore by their fruits you shall know them. Verse 21, here we get to the judgment. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, can get in. Into the kingdom of heaven. Here we finally are. We're finally at the kingdom of heaven. Okay, not everyone, because we've come through a straight and narrow gate, right? We're in the last room. Not everyone can say, Lord, Lord, 
who says, Lord, Lord, shall get in the kingdom of heaven. He that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. People will say, hey, didn't I do great stuff in your name? Verse 22, and I will say, I never knew you depart. So how, how do you get in if doing great works is not enough? 24, therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, that's who. And here you get another name. I will liken unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. By the way, rock. We're in the third room of the temple. There is a rock here. The rock that's in the dome of the rock. The foundation stone. The wise man who builds his house upon the rock is the man who makes it into the Holy of Holies and builds upon the foundation stone. And gains the title, I think, of wise. By the way, here's, I think, my last piece of homework for you uh, in the slides. Um, a Nephite prophet discusses wisdom, and he compares the wisdom of the world with true wisdom. And he says, true wisdom is hidden, seems to be hidden together with happiness. And to find it, you have to listen to the counsel of God. Take a look. Take a look. Find that passage. Um, the wise man built his house upon a rock. The rain descends. The flood came, but the house fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And by the way, maybe that's also a reference to the temple and the great temple quest, right? It is founded upon a rock. It will fall not. And everyone that heareth my sayings and doesn't do them will be as a fool who builds on the sand, the rain washes him away. This is maybe my favorite verse of the whole thing, and I have many verses I like in this. 28, and it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished. <laughs> yeah, I bet they were. <laughs> uh, for he taught them as one having authority. And not as the scribes. Because he's not making an argument. He's not trying to convince people to do a follow a particular moral line of behavior. He, he is inducting them into the ordinances, the mysteries. This is his language, Matthew 13. The mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Or that Nephi says the mysteries of God. Other examples. I'll let you. I'll, I'll. I'll give you enough detail to find these, but I'll, I'll just throw some out. Uh, Lehi dies. Nephi grieves. He writes his grief in what is sometimes referred to as the Psalm of Nephi. The language in the Psalm of Nephi is straight out of this. Keep the gate open. Let me come in and build upon the rock, God. And it's because look, Nephi is Nephi is again. He's changing status. He's going from being the son to being the father. He's losing his father. He has to recenter himself and remind himself. It's going to be okay. But fortunately, he's, an, he's a visionary man. He's an initiate. And so the, the great thing that comforts him, that gives him comfort, is, uh, is, remind, is, is, this, is, is recentering in his experience in the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Go find that. There's a, there's a great passage where, I'll give you another one. Uh, there's a great passage where um, Lehi is exhorting his sons. Okay? The rougher edged sons <laughs> and uh and he says uh he says wake up arise out of the dust put on clothing be men come out of the darkness into light okay that is a straight up Temple exhortation. I'll let you find it. Right? So a Adam is made of the dust. You're lying in the dust like sleeping Adam. W uh, wake up. Get up. Become clothed. Put on the robes of righteousness. And like, like Nephi says, come out of the darkness into the light. Which, by the way, if we assume that Nephi is capturing Lehi's words accurately... That suggests that not only does Nephi think that his ultimate audience, who would be us, but maybe he was imagining his descendants, would recognize that imagery, but it strongly suggests that Laman and Lemuel recognize that imagery too, doesn't it? It strongly suggests that, that for, for this exhortation to have rung a bell with Laman and Lemuel, that Laman and Lemuel must have been visionary men. And boy, that adds a, 
that adds a tragedy, uh, a, a, an aspect of tragedy to the whole family drama, because 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 they they knew they should have known they could have known they're in the vision first Nephi eight they're so close they're almost there, and Lehi says just come the last way, and they don't, and he says that in the image of the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Now we're aware over time. I think I have one more slide. Um, hey, uh, what is this ordinance? Uh, you're going to meet God on the mountain on the way. You have teachings. You make covenants. There's a drama with multiple actors. I think there's a lot of reason to think that the story being told is the Eden story. By the way, I think in the Book of Mormon, the Book of Mormon gives us lots of reasons to think that the story being told here is the Eden story, right? Eden appears uh, in the book in the in old the Old Testament in Genesis and the then very briefly, in a, in a reference we all forget about in Ezekiel, and then that's it in the Old Testament. Whoever compiled, edited the Old Testament, they weren't super interested in the Eden story, but the Book of Mormon writers were. It was really important to them. By the way, here's another, here's another passage you can look up. You'll find this if you go through the exercise of looking up the word mysteries every time. Because there's a passage where, where Nephite prophets are preaching and uh, Alma says, uh, when people are wicked, they forget the mysteries. And they're talking to these people, uh, and, uh, and, and one of them then starts asking questions. And he says, hey, what is the deal with uh, Adam and Eve getting cast out of the garden and a tree and, a, and an angel with a flaming sword there? Right? Which is a, which is a vivid illustration of... Uh, of the of the the missionary's comment, when you when you sin, you forget the mysteries, and it tells us that this city too, like Laman and Lemuel, had once known the mysteries, but they've forgotten them. They don't understand. He doesn't get. He seems to be saying, "Well, you're talking about resurrection, but there isn't there like an angel with a flaming sword? I guess we're not going to get resurrected because he's forgotten the mysteries he once knew." And by the way, that tells us that. The mysteries again are the story of the of of the garden of being cast out of and returning to the garden. Uh, in this journey, you uh, you transform, you become perfect, you become a child of God, you become wise, you eat a meal with God and are clothed by Him. You approach Him asking for a gift, Matthew seven. Uh, if you were a university approaching a rich man asking for a gift, the word you would use would be endowment, okay? Uh, you become divine. You become the righteous who shine in the kingdom of God. You build upon the rock. If you become the, one, the wise one who dwells upon the rock, that's where God's throne is. This is an ordinance about becoming a divine person. And by the way, the Beatitudes, I think, the, I think this is all I think, if you if you have stuck around this whole time and your takeaway is well Dave thinks that but he's probably wrong you are that is you are entitled to that view okay this is all things that I think the seven blessings these are the seven blessings of the Beatitudes these are not the list in order um, in which they're given in Matthew five I think it is the list in order in which you experience them in Matthew six and seven you 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 bless that you'll see God which you do. When the Lord Melchizedek comes down and feeds you a feast, you're blessed that you'll inherit the earth, which you receive that blessing when, when he dresses you as he clothed Adam, and you become the heir of Adam. You inherit the earth. You'll be filled with righteousness. Again, I already called this one out, right? You hunger and thirst after righteousness. That's Melchizedek. Melchizedek feeds you a feast of his own flesh and blood. You're comforted by the receipt of the Spirit. Why do you eat the feast of bread and water, flesh and blood of the Lord? It's to have the Comforter with you. Uh, you are called the children of God. You're called that expressly in Matthew 7 when, when you go and approach to exchange four messianic symbols with God, uh, apparently, before you can quite enter into the kingdom of God. At your judgment, you obtain mercy. And finally, at the very end, you enter into the kingdom to uh, build upon the rock. So the fact that these blessings aren't a random grab bag, but they seem to describe what happens 
uh, at the climax of the ordinance, to me, is a strong confirmation that this is not a figment of my imagination or Jack Welch's imagination, um, that we're seeing something real. And again, um, I think when you start looking at the Book of Mormon through this lens, you see more and more, you get more and more out of the Book of Mormon text, and also more and more out of the Sermon on the Mount, one hopes also more and more out of your personal temple experience, and the best of all, more and more out of your personal spiritual journey. Now, that is everything from me. I am very conscious that I am way over, but I think the idea was to have a Q&A, and I don't have to go. I'm going to sit down and pull my standing desk down to a sitting height, and if anyone wants to stick around, I will stick around and talk. Well, thank you so much. Dave, that was awesome, and I I think uh, I know I'm excited to go back through the replay a little bit slower over the next uh, few weeks and really dig into uh, finding all of these fascinating things that you've just shared. So thank you so much um, for doing that. And. You know, I don't know if you have a question you'd like to ask Dave, um, pop it into the Q&A. There is one question that's been there since uh, early on. And so um, if you want to. Oh, Q&A, there we go. If you want to address that, you just kind of did. Uh, yeah. So it's, so it's so interesting. Okay, so the question, let's see. So people may not see this q a in the recording either is that right i should read this yes out yeah go ahead and read that uh feel free to answer after presenting your discoveries one how can we use this knowledge to add immense value to our endowment experience so so let me let me give a so what and like like the end one so what right people who are even believers in the book of mormon and and who um believe as i am and who believe as i do that joseph was a prophet of god uh Nevertheless, uh, we give an account that goes like this. Hey, uh, there was this great burst of revelation, and Joseph uh, translated the Book of Mormon. Then later, there was this other thing, and it was kind of Nauvoo-centric, but maybe it started with the Book of Abraham, but it, it resulted in the, the temple. Okay, um, I don't think that's the right way to see it. The Book of Mormon is one with the temple. It's one burst of revelation. It starts, it all, it all comes in 1829. Everything since then is just trying to understand uh, what, was, what, what we got in 1829. And so um, I think that kind of uh, holistic experience of the inheritance of the prophetic message of Joseph Smith to me, adds a lot of value, right? We, we should have seen in 1 Nephi 10, Nephi says, the way of the Lord is one eternal round. We should have said, oh, this is temple stuff right here at the very beginning, right? Um, uh, it, it is all one thing. You should be reading it, uh, thinking, reading it, the Book of Mormon, but actually the truth is all scripture. Thinking about the temple, looking for the temple imagery in there, saying, does the presence of temple imagery tell me anything additional, right? And, and I think one of the key points you're, you're kind of touching on here, Elior, is, um, and I know I haven't read the whole question, right? We got more question here. I just read one. Is, uh, my, my brother asked me a variant of this at one point early on, and and he, let me rephrase what he said. Uh, Dave, are these things a reference to um, uh, to the the temple and things you do in the temple? Or are they are a reference to the spiritual journey of which the temple is a map? And the answer is yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. It is all those things. And, and in fact... Um, I, I try when I'm talking about this stuff, I, I do it, I fall into it anyway, because I am a I am an heir of the Enlightenment, okay? Um, I am a science fiction book editor. So I, I use the language of metaphor, and I say this is a symbol, or this is like. Um, that's mostly not how the Nephites talk. They say this is, right? This is. 
And I think steeping ourselves in the in the map and in the scripture is is important because that makes us more powerful, more successful, more open, wiser in the spiritual uh, journey. Right. That's that's uh, that's that's what I hope. Um, two, how can we spiritually join this age-old society of visual men or eventually have our own throne room theophany? This is a very big question. Um, I uh, one of the one of the things I worried early on when I started writing this stuff, right? I had various worries. One thing I thought was, well, maybe I'm wrong. I I no longer think I'm wrong. <laughs> but but. Another thing I thought was, well, maybe everybody knows this. Maybe this is obvious to everybody. And I'm and I'm like late to the party, right? And maybe I'm going to say this and people are going to go, yeah, Dave, duh, right? But I'm pretty convinced now that I'm also not late to the party, that somehow we have we have missed all this stuff. So so I don't I don't think. There's a, there's a reference in Alma 6 where Alma talks about, um, or it's not Alma, it's Mormon. He talks about, hey, they, they let everyone, I forget the verse, they let everyone come to the meetings. Nevertheless, the children of God met and fasted and prayed often. Well, nevertheless suggests that although everyone could come to some meetings, there was a group called the children of God that met privately to fast and pray, etc. Um, I don't think, I don't know that it's like that. I don't know there's anywhere to go except that um, here's what I think. We, we, uh, there is a journey that is the universal inheritance of mankind. It is the inheritance of the, um, Mongol shepherd girl with her falcon and her pony, just as much. It is the, the inheritance of me and you. Okay. And either we are on the path or we've lost our way and we're wandering in mists of darkness. There's no real alternative, right? We're, we're all, we're all on the path. And, um, I think we uh, we study the path. We uh, we 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 try our best in the path uh, to to stay on the path and keep progress moving forward. And we look for true messengers from our Father, right? And I don't know what else there is. I I know there are people. Well, let me say this: I believe that God um, does appear to people, to humans. I have not experienced that. So uh, um, I don't have a silver bullet. I don't have a, I don't know what the answer to, 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 to get you there is any differently from what I have already said. But I do think that that is a uh, noble and appropriate desire. If I can jump in there, I, and I, I'm not saying I haven't had that experience yet either, but I think that is the purpose of the Book of Mormon when when it's it says it's to bring us closer to God than any other book. When Joseph made that comment, I, I think if you study passages from it, particularly 2 Nephi 31 and 32, and uh, things throughout the book that are clearly examples of, of what people did, it, study what what it talks about that people did to have the experiences they did. I, I think that's part of why we're under condemnation for not using the Book of Mormon like we are supposed to, um, is because those things are there as examples for us. And so as we as we go through our journey back to the tree, uh, to experience these things, we should be seeking those things. And like, like President Nelson for years now has been encouraging, get personal revelation or you're not going to survive. And, uh, you know, in, in our day with, with so much going on, the only way we're, we're going to survive is to get to the tree. And I think that's the purpose of, Armageddon and some of these challenging events that are coming is to help us get to the tree, be a Zion people, so that Zion can come down and we are like them when they come. That we have to be like them 
at least a set of people have to be like them in order for that city to return and for everything to take place that that has been set in prophecy. So that would be my two cents. Um, there, there are passages throughout the Doctrine and Covenants and Book of Mormon that, that talk about these things, and I would just study those things and then make some type of daily revelation-seeking time part of your priorities so that you ask God every day, like, what am I supposed to do today? How do I follow your spirit today to lead me to these experiences? And I'll just say that's what I do. I, I try to to seek that kind of thing and um, listen to the spirit as much as I can. And I, I still make mistakes. The other day I made a mistake. I was like, that was probably a prompting and I didn't act on it. And the time passed. And, you know, that's that's all we can do is is try and improve on those things. And um, anyway, that would be uh, my thoughts. Yeah, I, I, I like that. I uh, Nephi does say, you know, uh, um, I wanted to know the mysteries of God, so I called upon God and he visited me. Nephi directly equates the mysteries of God with meeting God, right? That's yeah. It, for for Nephi as for Joseph, the mysteries of God are not um, incomprehensible, logically irresolvable chestnuts of theology, right? They are they are the the tools and the experience of meeting God. Yep. So there's another question up here. Uh, Bonnie asks, "Why do you say Melchizedek?" feeds us his flesh for the feast shouldn't it be Christ who feeds us his flesh yeah this is a this is a very big question um so i i uh i think that uh and i'm not sure how far back this goes um and I am aware of Melchizedek in uh, lectures on faith and uh, modern uh, um, uh, revelation. Um, and I don't know quite how to to read all of this, uh, but I think that the person who presides at the feast. Either it is understood to be Melchizedek, who is also Christ Yahweh the Lord, or it's the Lord who is also understood to be Melchizedek. Um, and I, I, I think it's not, uh, it's not an, it's not an accident that that uh, rather than talking about the priesthood of the Son of God, we talk about the priesthood of Melchizedek. And 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 I think it's a bit of a uh, Dodge to say it was because of Melchizedek's righteousness. I think those two, as far back as I can see, have always been closely um, connected. So uh, there are there are things I don't know, right? Um, and uh, but uh, I think I think it is a feast with the Lord, and you're eating His flesh and blood. Um, but I think in some sense. In the Sermon on the Mount, the the repeated reference to righteousness suggests that uh, that that is understood also to be uh, Melchizedek, who shows up and feeds a feast of feast to Mel to feast to, to Abraham, um, and who was identified as being the peaceable king. Um, I can't perfectly resolve all of that with sort of the contemporary, our contemporary LDS understanding that Melchizedek was a man who was not the same person as Jesus. I don't know the answer to that. Another question here. Uh, what then is the connection between Abraham who gave tithes to Melchizedek? So it's really interesting. There is a book called... Oh, I'm at my laptop. I can look it up. There's a scholar named Erwin Goodenough. Erwin Goodenough, and in his 1941, he published a book called. I'm going to look it up now because I cannot remember the name of the title. Um, he published a book about Philo. Um, uh, 
It's all these terrible reprints getting in the way. All right, I'm just not going to remember the name of the book. Um, he published a book where he said, to Philo of Alexandria is uh, about the time of Jesus. He is a, um, a scholar and a diplomat who lives in Alexandria in Egypt. He's Jewish. He writes a bunch of, you guys probably know this, right? He writes a bunch of essays about um, Old Testament stuff. Um, if you have read those, there are a number of, pass or, if you, or if you go back and read them now, there are a number of passages where Philo very provocatively refers to uh, mysteries and um, the uh, Erwin Goodenough's book. Um, he, he's most famous for his like Jewish symbols in the Greco Roman age or whatever the title is a big multi volume analysis of, of like Jewish imagery uh, in th the time of Jesus. But, but this, this book he talked about Philo's religion and says, um, Look. Philo is uh, making metaphors about his uh, his Judaism for a Greek audience. But if you look underneath the metaphor and say, well, what is Philo's Judaism? It doesn't appear to be rabbinical Judaism. <laughs> it's something different. And in particular, he says, Philo seems to read, Philo seems to uh, read the lives of the patriarchs and Moses as if they are the narrative of a mystery ritual. And he says, I don't know whether Philo actually knew uh, an actual liturgy, an actual ordinance or not. I think he says on balance, he thinks probably, but he just says, I don't know, right? Um, but that's how he reads the stories of Abraham Isaac and and Jacob. Um, <clears throat> that's interesting for a couple of reasons. One, um, so if we ask the question, is it possible that Nephi knew a mystery ordinance? Did Jesus know a mystery ordinance? Like we're not alone. We're not the only people who are looking at our ancient scripture and saying, hey, there seems to be a reference here to, to mysteries in the classical sense. Okay, people have done this about Philo. Um, two, I I think he's I tend to think he's right. I do think that um, uh, although it has come down uh, through and Oak was talking about this through editorial hands that are not necessarily friendly, and it's been cut up and we we're missing parts. But I do think the the reason we have so much narrative. So much so up front, uh, and commentators will usually say something like it's legendary. These are these are like the legends of the patriarchs, the 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 legendary cycle of Jacob, right? Was a, a, a thought to be a missing epic that's incorporated in the book of Genesis. I think it's much more likely that those stories um, were the uh, were somehow part of the mystery. Um, the mysteries of God at some point in time. And I think that might be when we, when we see Abraham meeting with Melchizedek, again, I, it may well be that there was like a day and in somebody's journal, if we dig it up at one point, it'll say on such, such a day at this time, Melchizedek, my boss met Abraham and administered the sacrament to him, right? That might well be. And also it might be that the reason it was important to think about and retain and tell that story is because that's one of many little windows into the peaceable feast with the Lord uh, is, uh, is, is that little story there. We're seeing a snippet of that same ordinance told as, uh, told as history. Um, and, and I think there's the interesting suggestion that, uh, Tithing is an obligation connected with uh, with being a temple participant, right? That uh, um, it's you're all in, you're God or Mammon, and we're not going to demand that you pay all your money now, uh, right? Because you, you live in the world and you have kids, 
Um, but as a token, as a down payment, you pay your tithing, and that's your ongoing obligation. All right. Well, let's take one last question here that looks like uh, you can maybe answer this one pretty quick. Um, Sarah uh -huh. says, I have noticed connection to Isaiah 1 to 8. Haven't read much further in Isaiah, so there be, may be more with Joseph Smith, Lehi, and Nephi. Such beautiful temple imagery there, too. Is there anything you could offer by way of comment on your insights there or homework I could pursue on this connection? And it's Isaiah 1 to 8 specifically? Yeah. Wow. Don't know if uh, that's not something off the top of your head. That may oh, be no, no. The, the problem is that it is. Uh, the problem is that it is, but it's so much. Um. I'm, I'm going to say, I'm going to tell you, boy, okay, I'm going to tell you what I think, but but I but I, I can't keep here for like two more hours and pull up another slide deck and say Hebrew this and right, which is which is my inclination, and but I can't do that. Um, I, I I I will say I recently did talk to the two stick of Joseph guys about this exact subject. They haven't yet posted this video, but it should come up very soon. Okay. So I'm going to tell you a very short version. And if you go on YouTube and look at the stick of Joseph, um, I think any day now they'll they'll post me talking about this for about 90 minutes. Okay. Um, I think the reason why Nephi shares Isaiah 2 through 14, is that it? It's 14, right? Um, whole is because Isaiah is extremely important to the Nephites. This is why they keep likening themselves unto him also, and why they keep quoting him elsewhere. And this has to do with Paul Hansen saying, this is, you know, the, the visionary movement arises with Isaiah. And it has to do with Jesus in Matthew 13 when he says, why do I speak in parables? Because you who have seen and heard the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven will understand what I'm saying but everybody else won't. And then he immediately connects himself to Isaiah 6 and says, this is I'm fulfilling the, pro the prophecy or possibly the method of Isaiah, the method that God gave Isaiah to prophesy, to deliberately prophesy in a way people wouldn't understand. What is the, what is the great thing about Isaiah? I, 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 I sort of think this is um, and I've, I've walked a little bit up to the edge of this today already. So now I'm going to like state it fairly baldly and it is what it is. You can listen to me talking about it with the stick of Joseph guys. I sort of think that this is kind of right on the edge of our know what is knowable for us. It's, it's, it's sort of the, um, the thing that is sitting there waiting for us to like realize we've been missing it, repent, and ask for more so that we can get out of this 195-year rut we've been in, okay? Here's how I read, um, let's call it Isaiah 2 through 9. You said one through eight, but one is probably written later as an introduction, and Nephi doesn't include it anyway. Let's talk about two through nine. Isaiah three sets out an apostasy. What kind of an apostasy? We have a we have a deficit of leaders, and we need someone to be a leader because there's uh, there is no bread, uh, and we need a leader in this house. Uh, and uh, and and we we go grab a brother in the house of the father and ask him to be a leader. He says, "I can't. I don't have bread and I don't have any clothing." But the righteous are promised they'll be able to eat the fruit anyway. And this talk of clothing and fruit ought to be setting off bells in our heads now. Okay, Isaiah three. There's an apostasy. There's a problem. It's a deficit of leadership. Isaiah four is the response. Seven women will take hold of one man and say, listen, we'll provide the bread and the clothing, but we need someone to bear the name. 
Now, again, I talked about doubled visions. So there's a, there's a problem solution. Isaiah 5 and 6 then repeat problem and the solution. And Isaiah 5 in particular is where it gets really heavy. Um, Isaiah 5, I, I, I'm not going to show you the evidence for this. Go watch the Stick of Joseph conversation, okay? Isaiah 5, I believe, is Isaiah witnessing what Hezekiah does when he changes the temple. But Isaiah doesn't approve. In fact, Isaiah experiences the changes that are made as a rape of a divine being, as an assault on an angel. And he calls them out for it. He says, their sin is as Sodom. They hide it not. And he's talking about and using the same language as when the men of Sodom come to Lot's house and say, bring, bring out your visitors that we may know them. Well, that's in, in Isaiah 5.18. Bring the, bring the counsel of the Holy One of Israel come forth that we may know it. Except the counsel of the Holy One of Israel is the tree of the Holy One of Israel. And I think that what's happening in Isaiah 5 is that Hezekiah and his work gangs are moving the menorah. They are moving the tree of life. They are moving the great symbol that Nephi in I in ne first Nephi eleven, when when he's at when he asks the angel for an explanation, what is the tree that is white and beautiful? The angel shows him a woman that is white and beautiful. Nephi knows a woman who is a tree, and Isaiah does too. And so Isaiah witnesses Hezekiah moving the tree changing light for dark and dark for light, sweet for bitter, bitter for sweet, calling good evil, patting yourselves on the back. Their sin is as Sodom, they hide it not. Dragging the menorah out is like trying to drag the angels out of Lot's house to sexually assault them. This is what's in, 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 in Isaiah 5. And the response is that Isaiah is called, so again, it's Three and four are an apostasy in a heaven's response. Five and six are the apostasy, the assault on the temple, and heaven's response, which is the calling of Isaiah. And Isaiah is in the temple, says, Here am I, send me, and a coal is placed upon his mouth to burn him. And he's told to prophesy in a way, this is a great question because it comes right back to the subject matter. He is told to prophesy in a way that he will not be understood. And boy, hasn't that been a, a mission fulfilled? <laughs> and so, and so, and so, what Isaiah does is prophesy using temple imagery, and so those who don't know it just can't see it. And Jesus in Matthew thirteen says, "I'm doing the same thing Isaiah did. I'm prophesying in the language of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, so that those outsiders can't see it." And Nephi says, I'm giving away your homework now. It's 1 Nephi 32, 4. If you don't understand, it's because you ask, you don't ask, neither do ye knock. Therefore, you're not brought forward into the light, but you perish outside in darkness. Right? These men are both following the method of prophesying of Isaiah, which was a method to get through a time of, of royal apostasy, a time of royal oppression. That's Isaiah 3 through 6. 7, 8, 9 are super, are super, super interesting. And let me just summarize them very, very pithily, okay? Isaiah 7, forget about the wars of the kingdom of, of Judah stuff, okay? Um, ask for a sign. The Lord will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive. By the way, it's not a virgin, okay? That's a bad translation. The Hebrew and the Greek are very clear. It's the virgin, the virgin shall conceive, and we'll call his name uh, Emmanuel, which means God's with us. Chapter 7 is a prophecy. The virgin will have a son, Emmanuel. Chapter 8, it's got some phallic imagery. It says, I took with me, uh, Uriah, I think it's Uriah the priest for a witness, and I went in unto the prophetess, to, I'm, I'm not looking at it, so I'm paraphrasing, but it says to write upon a great roll with a man's pen. This is a euphemism, 
right? This is this is sexual imagery. It's a euphemism. But man, isn't that interesting? I take with me a priest for a witness, and I approach the prophetess. So seven, the virgin will conceive. Eight, I approach the prophetess, but it's it, that doesn't mean Mrs. Prophet. It's this is a serious business. There's a witness. Nine, a son is born. Right? That son is that son is Jesus. This is Handel's Messiah, wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, the old Greek doesn't say any of that. It just gives him one title. It says uh he will be the angel or the messenger of great counsel. Counsel means the tree. Okay. Um, I think all of that is right at the edge of our understanding, but I will say this, and I know there's a risk that I've already lost some of you and you're like, Dave, you are, I now see you are an apostate and I dislike you. And I understand that reaction, but I will tell you this. I believe that Isaiah and Jesus Christ in his mortal ministry and Nephi all knew as sacred things, a divine woman and she was part of the temple order. And she was at the center of the temple order. And one way to talk about her is Eve. And one way to talk about her is the virgin. And one way to talk about her is as the counsel of God. Right? And by the way, in Moses, where he says, man of counsel is my name. There, there is no separate word for husband in Hebrew. You can either say man or you can say Lord. That's it. That's true in modern Hebrew too. There's no husband. You say, that's my man. Right? Or she is my she is my lady, he is my lord. Man of counsel is my name, is I am the husband of the great tree. This is, I think, at the very edge of knowability. I think it's all there in the scriptures, it's planted there. I think we are supposed to try to struggle with this stuff and try to understand it. And I think that we don't get to know anymore until we've struggled enough. And I don't know when that is. But I guess I'm excited that either I get to live to find out the answer, or I die, and then I find out the answer anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, am, I would be very sad if the result of me answering that question offended you. But that is what I think. And I talk more about that, again, with a stick of Joseph, guys. It'll come out in like... I don't know, a week or something. Well, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Dave. That's, that's interesting. Um, I, th I think you're right. There's, well, there's so much that we just don't know, but what's cool is for 195 years, you know, a lot of this stuff's been hidden and then, you know, certain things come out, whether it's by members of the church or even among the scholarly community, something comes out, it triggers some new thought, and then we go down these rabbit holes that are like, whoa, didn't see this before. So, no. yeah, we'll, we'll keep learning, and uh, I'm sure there's more to come. That's the quest. Keep learning. Yep. Well, thank you again. I, I really appreciate uh, your time, and I know everybody has uh, gained a lot from this. We've got a lot to to chew on going back through this again uh, on a video replay. So um, thank you for uh, being on. Hey, my pleasure, Oak. Thanks for having me, everyone. Thanks for your questions in the chat. And uh, I look forward to connecting again later. All right. Sounds good.